it's quite hard when you don't have a cameraman. Uh, anyway. Okay, hit me. Okay, what well, you first got? First, I will start in Russian language okay. because I need to introduce the video and okay. then we will talk. Привет, ребята. Прежде чем мы начнем этот разговор, я хочу вас предупредить. Все видео будет на английском языке полностью от и до. Вот после того, как я закончу эти слова. У вас есть три варианта. Первый вариант, самый сложный. Вы можете поставить это видео на паузу, пойти выучить английский и, соответственно, потом посмотреть это видео на английском языке. Второй вариант. Вы можете выключить это видео и сказать, да черт, я не для того жил свою жизнь в своей стране, чтобы еще и на английском что-то слушать. И третий вариант, самый простой. Под этим видео есть кнопочка, она выглядит вот так. Я не знаю, где сейчас картинка появится. Нажмите на нее, и появятся русские субтитры, которые я вручную сделаю для этого видео после того, как его зап... мы его запишем. Поэтому включайте субтитры, смотрите их. Если вы не понимаете того, что мы говорим ну, на аудио уровне, там все будет понятно, все на русском языке. Не автоматически, нормальные русские субтитры. Поэтому включаем субтитры и погнали. I'm just saying about the subtitles because every time you know we're doing videos with any and we speak english or chinese in the video and people like oh, in the comments i don't understand why i live my life in russia i don't need your fucking english language i don't understand what you guys <laughs> saying why you don't don't you translate okay all right let me introduce you that's my old friend chris how many years we know each other like eight nine nine like, years now. yeah about nine years uh which year you came to china 2012. 2012. So next year gonna be like your decade anniversary. Yes, oh. the 10 year anniversary. Okay, we will have three parts of, like three and a half parts in this video. First, the smallest one, we talk about you because people want to know your background, you know, who I'm talking to. Mm. And second part, we will talk about US. Third part, we will talk about China. And the last part, the sweetest part, Russia. You've been in Russia, you know some something about <laughs> Russia. So we will have something uh, to talk about. Okay. So let's start from you. Okay. Uh, you're from DC. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's what's your education? You're a good educated, you're well-educated man. I hope so, yeah. I hope so. Uh, what's my education? Mm. I, s I went to university in Chicago, actually, mm -hmm. to a school called Northwestern University. And I got a degree in industrial engineering and also in political science and international relations. So I triple majored actually when I was there. And then I graduated, worked for a little bit, and got my master's degree in applied economics. Well-educated <laughs> man, not just educated, <laughs> a well-educated man. You have a big family, yeah? Mm. How many sisters? Five sisters. So six kids in the family. Five sisters, two brothers. So ah, eight total. Eight total, yeah. like huge family. Very big family. Very and big your family. parents still together? Uh, my dad passed away a few years ago, yeah, but uh, yeah. Till the end? Yeah, till the end. Okay, let's start to move to China slowly, slowly. Why China? Why China? Actually, it wasn't 100% my choice. Okay. You know, I was working with the company and uh, I got sent here. And it was, for me, a cool experience. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think that I would be here uh, as long as I have been here. Um, but after few months of being here I realized that I really liked it um, yeah, I, it's a very you know at that time and I guess it still is a very energetic place there's a lot of economic growth a lot of opportunities everything's changing very quickly mm -hmm. so I was like oh there's a there's a good energy here I like it and I was doing that work for a few years you know when you met me I had just come yeah, yeah. in and then um, after a few years, uh, myself and my partner, we decided to start, my business partner, we started a company mm -hmm. together that does IT work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, having your own company is kind of like having a baby, right? You have to nurture it and let it grow. And so now my baby's here in China, my company's here in China. So it's, it just kind of, keep, it's one of the things that keep me here. What's the biggest difference between American and Chinese mentality, people mentality. About what? About everything, like general, in general. Well, okay. I would say the biggest difference is just uh, culturally, Americans are very independent minded. Mm -hmm. You as a person, you have your right to pursue a path, a direction or ideas that you want to pursue. Whereas in China, I think there's a lot more of a collective view about things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, from the individual person, people 
are always worried about their families and like what their you know what their family are going to think about the decisions they're making. Uh, inside a company, people generally are like really focused on the company objectives as opposed to like you know what they want to do with their mm -hmm, lives or mm -hmm. their career. And even on a larger society level, like people are very willing or eager to follow the direction of the government. Okay. Whereas in the U.S., it's almost the opposite. Yeah. Where people are generally, I don't want to say don't not to trustworthy of the government, but people want to be very apart from the government. I heard many times, especially from American people who I know for all these years in China, that China is a kind of like a comfy swamp that you come here one time, you stuck inside like in a quicksand, you know, mm. and uh, you you never be the same again. You're coming back to U.S. and you cannot live there anymore. Something changing you. I call it the the panda in the zoo. So it's like if you're a panda bear and you spend all your time in the zoo, getting mm -hmm. fed every day, some like some guy brings you like bamboo and you just kind of have to sit there and look like a panda. Okay. You get used to this life. But if they were to release you back out into the wild, and you need to compete with. Then other you have pandas. to go find your own bamboo and like. It's not just cool being a panda anymore. And people don't want to take pictures of you. It can be really disorienting for a lot of people. And I think a lot of foreigners come here and they become like pandas in a zoo. Oh, like yeah. they just become used to a relatively comfortable life. Just like a panda in the zoo, maybe they're not necessarily accomplishing that much, but they're having a comfortable life mm -hmm. and they're happy and they have everything they need more or less. Yeah. And sometimes after they're tour in China, they go back home to the US or wherever, and they realize that they're no longer the panda in the zoo. They're back in the wild, and it's hard to adjust to that again, you know? But I heard and also seen a like a theory, is not just about panda in the zoo, that's pretty obvious yeah. thing, but about like you changing your mentality here, like especially mm. as an American who never traveled before, uh. and I heard that in US, the majority of the people don't even have passports. Mm. They never tra uh, travel anywhere uh, like abroad. Mm. So all the people who come here they already passed through some kind of mental border you know you you have enough courage to travel <laughs> abroad you know and you have enough courage to travel not to some other yeah. american satellites but like to the other part of the world the fucking china yeah. you know you just travel somewhere so far away there is uh, the more far only moon probably uh. and if you already have enough courage to like to do this you're already a different person and then when you then you come in here see the people from different countries mm. all of us are foreigners here and china is like have one specific thing that you will never become local there is no way for you to become local like i can come to us and after maybe 25 years my accent will change you know i will know all the details around me and no one will ever think people will think like okay he have his accent you know some western european accent and he's just local guy, local guy with accent. Here will never become local mm. because obvious reasons, mm. you know, our mm. faces. So living here in this kind of extreme atmosphere all the time, plus communicating with the people from all the world, changing you for sure. And I don't think it's I don't think it's unique to you know Americans. I think, mm. like you said, any foreigner who come here, yeah. when foreigners arrive, you know, there's definitely first of all, just coming here is a big, big deal. Big deal. And staying here and living here, you know, it definitely changes your outlook, not only on China, you obviously you learn about China, mm. but about, you know, actually all the friends you make from around the world. You know, I, I think living here, I've, you know, I didn't know any Russians back home. Yeah. Right. And How big chance was to get a Russian girlfriend back right. home? Very low. Very I mean, low. There's just not that many Russians around. And here it's like I have so many Russian, fr Russian speaking friends and, you know, friends from all over Europe and all over the world. And I think that's one of the great things about living abroad is that you you almost get like put in the same bucket with all these other foreigners right because mm -hmm. for chinese people we're all just foreigners yes you know they all just put us in one big bucket like the foreigners and you get to just meet people from all over the world and that also changes your outlook a lot i think for the better i mean for me anyway mm -hmm. um, but i think that happens for everyone who comes here you know and i think americans in general you're right you know compared to europe just because european countries are smaller and there's more mobility between mm -hmm. countries but I think Americans don't necessarily leave the U.S. as much as other people do. You know, when Americans come here, obviously it's a world of difference. I think right? it's like a big country problem. Russians the same. I know like hundreds or thousands of people who also never, because we have two passports, like mm. local and foreign passports. So many people don't even have foreign passports. Yeah. And they, like, we have Russia, 
from south to the north, right, from right. like ice mountains to the hot beaches, you know, we have everything. Why we need to travel abroad? Yeah. I think the same idea. And I think there's the same thing here in China yeah, too, yeah. actually. A lot of Chinese people like have never, well, first of all, they've never left. They've never met a foreigner, you know, and that's one of the funny things speaking Chinese or trying to speak Chinese to Chinese people. Like if you talk to me, like a lot of Americans or a lot of native English speakers have so much experience, like dealing with people or listening to people who aren't native English speakers. Mm -hmm. So you can literally speak really shit English with a, with a thick accent. Mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll understand what you're trying to say. When you speak to Chinese people, they have zero experience speaking to foreigners. So if you don't speak perfect Mandarin to them, they're like, Ting even dong, you speak perfect dong. Mandarin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many times that shit happened? We have a friends who just like have a fucking like almost PhD in yeah, Chinese yeah, 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 language yeah, yeah, yeah. and they speak better than them. They speak like a TV level yeah, of the yeah, yeah. Chinese and they speak to locals and they're like, Timbo Dong. Yeah. Timbo Dong. They're like, originally it's block and whatever, no matter how clear you say, yeah. if you talk to them by phone, they will understand everything. <laughs> when they when see they foreign see, yeah, face, yeah, yeah. something just like turned off. So I think you're off. right. It's like a big country thing. You know, when you're from a larger country, ge geographically large, like mm. there's just less incentive for you to leave. The habit, Chinese big, big habit to get drunk for any kind of possible reason. Go eat. They call uh -huh. it let's go eat uh -huh. and then get wasted quickly and like as quick as possible. Yeah. How hard was it for you when you just came to China? This was new for me. I remember one of the first times I went to a club. We went, we showed up at like 11, which is really early mm -hmm. to go clubbing in China. Yeah. And I remember I was walking in and like, they were like, wait, 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 wait. I was like, okay, what's going on? And then they were like bringing out a guy in like a stretcher who was just like totally passed out. Just totally 11. 11. <laughs> and I was like, what is going on, you know? So yeah, you know, I think it, Chinese people just drink differently. It's mm -hmm. a cultural thing. They, they drink fast and hard. They, they're not really, s I mean, maybe that's changing actually. Cause you know, you see in restaurants mm -hmm. now, more and more people like sip a glass yeah. of wine and like actually enjoy They're starting to get used for yeah, sipping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the whole notion of j sipping, talking, eating all at the same time was, it was foreign to them. Mm -hmm. But I think they're starting to change. A I have a bit. theory about that, about yeah. why they like trying to drink as quick as possible to get drunk as quick as possible. It's all about like um, boredom and you know, like the repetitive life yeah. when you're just doing all the same things and you have a lot of pressure inside, you need to release the pressure, yeah. but you don't have enough time because 8 a.m. you have to be in office. So you actually have to do everything quickly. After work, what you're going to do? Of course, Chinese person go eat. Yeah. That's like 100%. Yeah. After eating, you have like few hours before that moment when you have your six, seven hours of sleeping. Whatever kind of sleeping is drunk sleep, sober sleep, doesn't matter. You need to have your six, seven, eight hours. So to have six, seven, eight hours, you have to fall asleep around like 11 mm. to wake up at seven and eight going to be you're, you're going to be at office. So from seven to 11, yeah. after like your office close at six, seven you so finished your dinner seven to eleven you have to get wasted as soon as possible to reboot yourself yeah, yeah, yeah you're kind of in a rush yes yes that's my theory i think another part of it is just chinese practicality i think one thing one of the things i love about china is the people here are super practical yeah. and actually i think it's one of the things they They're have grounded in, they have in common with americans also actually and we can talk about this later that i think americans and chinese actually have a lot in common but one of the things that i like about Chinese China in general is that people here are just really practical. Mm -hmm. There's not that much room for bullshit. Like they call things black and white. Yeah. So like if they're there to drink, they're not gonna like bullshit around and like they don't have time for all the the foo foo. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. just want to like get drunk, mission accomplished, <laughs> and go. <laughs> And I think that's kind of a larger practicality in China that I like. Best burgers in the world, where and how to try them? Texas, Houston, Texas. Any specific place? No, I don't know any specific places, but I know that last time I was in Houston, mm -hmm. I went to a couple of places and they were fabulous. Nice. Very good burgers in Houston, Texas. Oh, I see a smile on the face. <laughs> I many? can tell. Wait, 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 I can also tell you what makes a good burger. Okay. I think people always ask about what's you know where is you can get a good burger. What's a good burger? I feel like you could actually get a good burger anywhere. Okay. The trick is it's just you know how it's made, and it's got to be. It's all about the juiciness. It's all mm -hmm. about the flavors and the juices and the sauces and sauces. I think any excellent burger, it's not, they don't just put ketchup on a burger. They put some special sauce 
And that's what makes an awesome burger. So if you awesome create burger. your own favorite perfect sauce, eat Exactly. Will. If you make the right sauce, you can take, I mean, okay, obviously you have to have good meat quality. Yeah. Right? So ni nice belly. Yeah, but even you can take an average burger and make mm -hmm. it taste pretty awesome with some really good sauce. That's so the secret is sauce. The secret's in the sauce. That's why we say Bun, that. Bun, doesn't matter. Huh? Bun. Ah! If you, have a, if you have a good enough burger, you won't even notice the bun. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> uh, the big question, what's in general, simple, like normal, regular Americans thinking about China and about the situation, you have like trade war and mm. stuff. And what's the latest political trends in your relationships and relationships between, co wow, between countries? I think, you, I think you just need to look at the news and you'll see you know, what the trends are. I mean, that's, that must be a, like a question a little bit further, but I will ask right now. Mm. Is there any trustable American news anymore? Because all of them like influenced by like leftists, influenced by some like billionaires and everything. Like all the news, what I see, they are changing their point of view faster than I'm changing underwear, you mm -hmm, know, mm -hmm. more often. And I don't even understand. Like I was watching, like reading some Washington Post for years. Mm. It was just like a pretty obvious thing for me. It was free in Apple store mm -hmm, or something. Mm -hmm. And I was reading it and it was right as fuck in the beginning. And now is left as fuck mm. and completely like rebooted. So is there any news that you can trust in US that not influenced by modern trends? So there's a couple questions. Yeah, that's First like is what do, what do average people think about yes. China? The general viewpoint, or the average person's general view on China has become more negative over mm -hmm. the past 10 years. Um, and I think Trump and his trade war and all that definitely played a role mm -hmm. in that. And I think media also plays a role in that. And that gets to your second question is, is there any objective media in the US mm -hmm. And I guess I would just answer and say, is there any objective media, period? Yeah, right? that's the point. <laughs> like, is there any objective media, period? And I think the answer is really difficult. You, you, it would be really hard to say with a straight face, yes, there is a super objective media. Mm -hmm. So all media, I mean, in the West, in the US, there is no such thing as state media, right? Mm -hmm. So all media is a private enterprise and all private enterprises are driven by profit. Yeah. And I think that every media organization has a target audience that they want to speak to that mm -hmm. they know that if they say certain things people click people watch and when people click and when people watch people watch ads and these media companies make money that's how they make money no, of course. all media companies make money from getting your attention they monetize your attention so that's their business model so basically if you already have some point of view you're just going to find some tv channel or news that, that supports echoes, your that echoes that yeah. point of view and that's the that's the problem capitalist media right I mean, there's also a whole host of problems with state media, but capitalist media is not necessarily there to give you the news. Mm -hmm. capitalist, media, capitalist media is there to capture your attention by telling you, giving you the news that you're going to find captivating, right? So that's why, uh, you know, there's, I think, an increasing polarization with media outlets. Mm -hmm. You know, like you have, like, for instance, the New York Times, which is very left, and you have Fox News, which is very right. And each of those outlets are speaking to a specific audience. Mm -hmm. You put all that aside though, no matter what media outlet you're looking at or listening to or viewing, um, the general discourse or conversation about China has become much more negative. And in terms of politics, I would say probably one of the few things that all political, both political parties in the US agree on is that China is a competitor and potentially a threat. Okay. So I think uh, the China competition or becoming increasingly competitive with China mm -hmm. is one of the few things that brings people from all political parties in Washington together. Okay. So everyone can pretty much agree okay. on that. Okay, I thought different. No, yeah, that's, the only that's people who are the, the most pro-China like pro -China, pe the yeah. most pro-China people are big businesses because they're making a lot of money here, yeah, right? Of course, and they don't want to uh, like disrupt. Apple. They don't want to disrupt. Uh, their profit outlooks in China, but, but I, your, think, I think what's your future prediction in like in a business way? They will move out in the long term, all the factories out of China, or what? No, I don't think so. I think it's really difficult to move out of China there's because there is a lot of talks around this. No, I, I, there's there's no alternative at this point. Like India? No. Vietnam? No. I mean, there. Are, I mean, th those are places you can go to, but they can't replace China. They can augment China, right? They mm. can supplement China. Like mm. you can have 
whatever, three factories in China and one in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. But you're not gonna move all four factories to Vietnam. There's just not enough people, not, their supply chain doesn't exist. So from a business perspective, it is practically impossible right now mm -hmm. to diversify, to completely get out of China. Mm -hmm. You can diversify away from China, mm -hmm. right? So you can have a factory in Brazil or India or, or Philippines, but uh, moving out of China completely is not in the cards right okay. now. As long as we're talking uh, about like media, so mm -hmm. we basically have to talk about the freedom of speech yeah. because it's one of the basic American things. It's like in your constitution, mm -hmm. you have, it's like Bill, first. The or, Bill of Rights. Yeah, the, the Bill Amendment, of Rights, yeah. yeah. So what's happened with that? like cancel culture when you say something wrong that not leftist anymore people block you it's a private companies uh, like twitter yeah. or instagram or whatever the question my question is it's not question from subscribers uh. it's personally for me don't all these big companies like twitter have too much power overpowered right now and should like government take a bit of control of this situation because they became like a biggest media mm. and this media right now rules they because media don't give a shit about your like freedom of speech they don't care it's their private company rules they can block you for whatever they want mm -hmm. because that's in a term of like yeah terms of service terms of service terms of service and nobody read the terms of service yeah. yes and they can add whatever they want anytime yeah so they can block you anytime so that's cancel culture for me that's like one of the most toxic things right now what do you think about this okay so should it be allowed i think yes should the government intervene i think no why uh and okay so and is it a bad thing i would say yes okay but i would say it's a bad externality or a bad side effect of a system that generally works well okay like all these massive media companies, like let's say, let's not call them media companies, let's call them platforms, yeah. like Twitter, Social Facebook, platforms. Instagram, whatever, YouTube. Mm -hmm. They didn't become huge by X. They became big for a reason. They became big because it, they allowed people discourse. They allowed yeah. people to share their opinions, to share everything from cat memes to political opinions, yeah. right? And they are huge and powerful because we go to them and, and they them. capture our attention, yeah. right? And okay, now you can argue that they capture our attention because they have amazing AI algorithms that show us exactly what we want to see. Okay, fine. But the point is, they exist because the free market, mm -hmm. free people making free decisions about how to, where to spend their attention are deciding. Now, if these guys say, I built a platform, and if you talk about whatever, far-right neo-Nazi shit, I'm gonna block you. Or if you talk about, you know, um, you know, militant Islamic shit, I'm going to block you, right? Just like you said, they have terms of service and they say, I'm, I'm going to block certain things that are outside the bounds of discourse. Yeah. And they decide this. We could say like, all right, I'm not going to use Twitter anymore because Twitter doesn't have... But there is no alternative. There's no alter but that's the thing. There's no alternative because the demand for that alternative doesn't exist. So maybe if, they... If, if, again, free people in a free market making free choices about where to spend their attention, felt that I don't want to use Twitter because it's not showing anything useful. Here comes useful. the monopoly rules. No, 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 no. You don't need monopoly rules for people to make a decision. If people, if pe I mean, t all these companies started they from nothing. They became already a monopoly. It's a fact. There's a difference between a monopoly on oil or on software and then a monopoly on people's attention. Mm. You can, it's very it's easy. product. It's mm. like people selling, yeah. selling and buying. I would shit. argue, my argument would be, you know, the economics you call it the transition costs, right? Like it's relatively cheap to try another platform. Mm -hmm. It's relatively cheap to start another platform. Okay. Right. The question is what, makes these platforms non-existent or small is that people don't care enough to use them or to switch their or yeah. change to so my point is like cancel culture okay it sucks it's stupid but at the same time it's not it hasn't gotten bad enough that people actually care enough mm -hmm. you might care yeah some other people care but the vast majority of people are still going to keep using twitter and instagram and facebook they don't care they, they feel as if they can it's worthy of their attention mm -hmm. and it's worthy of them to participate by sharing content. Don't you afraid that we will raise a new generation of the people who will think that that's part of normal? It like, is, but it is part of normal. When, but is that, when I mean, private company can completely make you disappear from yeah. internet yeah. just because 
this Wednesday they decided that saying letter P is illegal in okay, their but platform. See, but see, now you're taking something to an extreme. No, that, yeah, that's yeah, what's yeah, happening no, right no, now. No, it's all started it great. It's all, it's all started from like Islamic things yeah, or no, no, Nazi but shit. Yeah, but now it's all about like, if I will say that there is only two genders in a Twitter, I have a lot of chances to get blocked. I don't know about that. I and don't know. We saw the situation, but it's it's actually a real situation in uh, Twitch, yeah. you know, the streaming yeah, yeah, platform. Yeah, yeah. In a Twitch, when guy just called someone in a in a chat, he called girl, and that person in a chat start to talk like, uh, "How come you can uh, trying to assume my gender?" Yeah, blah yeah, blah yeah. blah blah blah, and they blocked the streamer. Right. He just striked him. That sucks. And. That's but, but, but this is my point is that sucks and that okay that's not a great outcome but my point is like that's such a small percentage of users mm. and people's interest that it doesn't matter but when I'm not saying it makes it good or bad I'm just saying that like if the now if you if you go and so the platform start doing something like egregious like mm. really ridiculous stuff, stuff like, then people are just gonna stop using the platforms right mm -hmm. so that's my point it's like they haven't done anything that is gonna that is so bad they're gonna drive people away if they do if they do cross some line no one knows where it is mm -hmm. people are gonna take their attention somewhere else or start using another platform or start another platform mm -hmm. I believe that I mean I just think that like they these are all capitalist companies mm -hmm. they're trying to make money and they're not gonna do anything that tr dramatically reduces their profits right so if I start blocking everyone for ridiculous reasons mm -hmm. It's going to have an impact on my bottom line. I'm going to lose attention. I'm going to lose. I'm going to lose users, and I'm not so going to do that. So you're thinking like, so I, as I, long as I there is no critical mass of exactly. Uh, yep. I mean, people are always going to be unhappy. There are always going to be people on the left or on the right who are bitching and moaning and whining, mm -hmm. which is normal. And there are always going to be people who get blocked for bad reasons, right? Mm -hmm. Which which is unfortunate. But I think the vast majority of people are blocked for good reasons. Who are blocked? Mm -hmm. Who? They're, they're blocked for they're not they're not posting normal stuff or mm -hmm. subscribing to or views it's a, it's, anyway it's a censor yeah it's censorship but yeah, i would much i would much i would much rather have a company censor than a government censor because because the government is a monopoly these companies are monopolies that's open to debate mm -hmm. i can, if i want to stop using facebook i can delete it tomorrow yeah. and i can start using twitter instead or i can start using some far right you know app that just gets started yeah, there right there's no one inside yeah I can do that though. If I don't, if my government is censoring stuff, I can't switch governments. Mm, yeah. Right? And that is the ultimate form of monopoly. So I would much rather have money grubbing, profit loving capitalists like running my media than the government. Yeah, but there is a theory, mm. and many people support this theory, that government actually should have the monopoly for punishment. That's why we choose this government, mm -hmm. like to give them that right to judge people, yeah. to judge, to give them right for something. Like, and only mono uh, only one monopoly, only one chosen government, because you cannot choose the CEO or trends of the Twitter. Right, they have their own trends. They are not under any control of any government because they do whatever they want inside of their platform. Mm. It's kind of like a small universe inside of the universe, yeah, small yeah. country inside so of the country. So the theory is what? The government the theory should... Sh the theory that government should have this monopoly for blocking, punishing, canceling and everything with judgment, with law. Because the thing that disturbs me in the latest trends, what's going on right now, that people get like canceled. Mm. They losing their jobs. They like losing their ability to use internet mm. because they cannot like use Twitter, use Instagram, use YouTube just because some private company decided that they need to be canceled without any trial, you mm. know, without any arguing, like without right for protection themselves. Like right. you cannot protect. There is no lawyer who will just go to the Twitter and talk to them and try to like uh, bring you back. No, there is no way. They just say like, fuck you. We do whatever they want. It's our platform. We can block you anytime. Mm. And when they became this kind of uh, uh, monopoly, like Twitter and Instagram and YouTube, that's the three big monopolies because there is no alternatives. Yeah. And they became so big, yeah. so huge. It's like insane. They are worldwide monopoly yeah. for, for the things they're doing. That should be some 
you know, special regulations for these kind of huge, mm. don't you think? Is it like right? Should should be should they be under some special control? By the like when you the grow, government. yeah, by the government. When you grow so big, when you already can compete with government in some things. Mm -hmm. And then the question becomes, which government? U.S. government? No, they belong to U.S. U.S. government, mm -hmm. of course. They are U.S. companies. That's mm -hmm. why we're talking about U.S. right now. Mm -hmm. So, is there room for regulation? Absolutely. I mean, there's always. I mean, there's always room for regulation when you have, like you said, these massive companies, mm -hmm. right? Like, is there something that could be done better to make the, you know, the marketplace more competitive mm -hmm. so that there's less monopolistic behavior? For sure. Now, do I know what that regulation looks like? No, and I think do, writing that regulation is extremely difficult because there's certain lines you don't want to cross. You don't want the government to be, at least in my opinion, you don't want the government to be able to tell me what I can and cannot do with my company, mm -hmm. right? That happens every day, right? They tell me I can't pollute and I can't, you know, mm -hmm. I have to treat my workers well and stuff. There is so much government regulation. And that's, I think all the regulation we have now, a lot, you know, there's always, discussion mm -hmm. about what's fair regulation, what's bad regulation, right? But regulation exists and in, in general the idea of having government regulate companies That's why government is, exists. has been good. No. Government doesn't exist for regulation, but so government, government regulation what? to protect its people. Okay. To, okay. to, 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 to give the greatest good to the greatest But regulations is a kind of protection. Yeah, okay, but that's not the reason government exists. Okay. The reason government exists, in my opinion, is to provide the greatest good for the greatest number mm -hmm. of its citizens, of its citizens. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a lot of times when helping, your, you, helping other people helps your people too. That's another discussion. Anyway, but the point is, regulation I think is good. And I would, if you were to ask me, should these platforms, should there be more government regulation to these platforms, I would say yes. Okay. okay. If you ask me what is the exact regulation, mm -hmm. I would say that really takes a lot of debate and a lot of people who understand the trends of what's actually happening mm -hmm. and can write something that's fair to the average person and fair for the companies. How many guns your family have? Uh, I personally uh, don't have any, Okay. but I have a sister that has, I believe, a couple mm -hmm. now, <laughs> and I believe another sister's husband has a few they're living also in somewhere in dc no no they live outside dc they live in one lives in arizona okay and the other one lives in just outside the city okay mm. okay cool okay let's move back to china okay. talk about america a lot okay okay, okay. is the this on it's on oh, yeah it's okay. just too bright okay so going back to china a biggie again a big question chinese economical power the huge economical power of china is it a bubble or is it real and what you like personally predict in the future what's okay. gonna happen next first is it a bubble or is it real i would say both i think the long-term 50-year his uh, economic trajectory for china is up mm -hmm. uh are they in a bubble right now i would say probably nothing goes up in a straight line forever mm -hmm. so i think if you have an economy that's been growing extremely quickly for 40 years, mm -hmm. there are a lot of excesses built up in the economy now that uh, it is likely that at some point mm -hmm. in the near future, there will be economic problems in China. Now, so you predict some problems. Yeah, for sure. But in the long term, over the next 50, 100 years even, you know, I think the Chinese economy, is, if they maintain uh, a certain amount of stability, I think they're just, it's inevitable they're gonna keep growing. Is it too late to invest in China right now? No, no. It's like the right time. It's always, I mean, I wouldn't say it's always the right time, but there are always opportunities to invest, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, if you were just looking at whatever, 20 years ago, I would say invest in real estate and infrastructure companies mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, but you know, now the future, a lot of, everyone knows, not everyone knows, but it's in becoming more apparent that the Chinese economy is gonna rely more on the service industry, mm -hmm. on service industries, so, you know, instead of factories or building roads there you have to look at finance finance is a huge area of focus especially for big american companies all american banks want to come in here and do finance right because it's it's a basically a completely new virgin market mm -hmm. um you know where you can sell financial products and services w what do you think will they let yeah. this happen yeah, yeah really yeah they're actually liberal liberal 
liber liberalizing, <laughs> liberalizing their their financial markets a lot more. Okay, cool, cool. So cool. I think I think yeah, if you want to invest in China, there's always opportunities. Obviously, people asked a question: How you feel about like a basic normal life in China, and like what kind of behavior you have from people, especially your like you're black, and black normally assumed in China is African. Mm. So. Ha do you have any like problems with that that you need to prove that you're not from Africa, mm. that you're American? And like, how is like basic life in China, like daily life? Okay. Well, I think daily life, first of all, we probably don't live a normal daily life than most other people, mm, yeah. like Chinese people live, right? I think we're pretty, spe I don't want to say special, but we have a unique lifestyle here. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, so I would say, in terms of is my daily life here comfortable? I would say, yeah, very comfortable. Um, you know, the flip side of that is, you know, I, I, you know, I have a business here, so I would say I'm really busy mm -hmm. these past couple of years, been really busy, um, but busy in a way that I like mm -hmm. being busy, you know, it's growing your own company. So I would say, is my daily life, am I happy with my daily life? Yeah, I have a great apartment, I, you know, have good friends, I am enjoying my career, so all that's good to go. If, it were to, if you want to say, how's your daily life in China compared to what you would be doing in the U.S.? I would say, obviously, here we're foreigners. We stand out. Mm -hmm. We are uh, kind of separate from the rest of society in a lot of ways. But mostly, this question was about like basic racism and everything. Oh, okay. Like, so, so let me get to that. So racism for me has not really been an issue here. Mm -hmm. I think. Okay. So there's two kinds of racism. There's there's racism where people just hate someone mm -hmm. because they have like an idea in their head that just makes them hate someone like toxic racism. yeah there's, there's 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 racism where it's just like i have ill will towards mm -hmm. you and i don't like you and i would i would just i want you to disappear mm -hmm. right so that's kind of a, a toxic mm -hmm. racism and then there's what the, the racism i would call like innocent racism mm -hmm. it's just like you just don't know any better right yeah you've never met a person from this race or whatever before you have zero experience mm -hmm. and you have it's also mostly based on stereotypes yeah you have stereotype ideas in your head and that's the only information mm -hmm. you have to run on but once you meet someone you your mind is open enough to like change those like mm -hmm. very basic views and i think in terms of racism in china that's the kind of racism that exists it's like an innocent just stupid racism mm -hmm. because they just don't have any other information to go on but i found the v actually, you know, I would say the vast, vast majority of Chinese people are very willing and open to getting to know someone, mm -hmm. and they're also very willing and open to change their views. Yeah, that's um, true. because you know, as opposed to the West or in the U.S., ra where racism is like really deeply rooted, and it's mm -hmm. that kind of toxic racism. Mm -hmm. Here, it's like I just don't know black people, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so I'm just going to assume you're from Africa. Yeah, but and then once they yeah, realize you're okay. not, and once they or they realize like you know, you're an interesting person to talk to and you don't necessarily conform to the stereotypes that they have in their head. They're actually very willing to change those stereotypes. Yeah, so you are actually, you also have to do some work to make it happen, you know, yeah. to pass through these kind of basic racism. I think, I think, it, I wouldn't call it work. I think you, once you open your mouth and interact with people. Like, you, you need to be open-minded. Yeah, you need because to be, you actually, I would, okay, I would say the work is you have to be patient. You have to yeah. be, you, yes. ca you can't be like, uh, you, you can't be just like a softy, yeah. you know, you have to be, you have to understand that people have some preconceived ideas and they're just out there and you so can't let that. a certain amount of patience, yeah, patience. you need to have. Yeah. I and know I, think, I think that works both ways, actually, when you're dealing with foreigners in Chinese. Yeah. They have to be patient with us a lot, right? And yeah. we have to, and, right. you know, I think we have to be patient with them. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think it works both ways. Yeah, I think yeah, it works both absolutely ways. Absolutely agree. I will skip few questions. We will come back later okay, okay, about okay. these because we already started to talk about like a racial racial things. Mm. And let's go to America right now mm. and talk about the BLM and mm. stuff. First, everyone, of course, want to know from especially a black person, black person from US, mm. well educated black per person from US, your opinion about the whole George Floyd situation. Well, so the fact that the episode with George Floyd happened in the first place, I think is a tragedy mm -hmm. and it's an American tragedy. And I think it's a uh, really painful for Ameri Americans of any color mm -hmm. to watch, because I think it shows probably one of the most ugly yet persistent. It's like a cancer. They just won't go away. It's like a persistent. Uh, 
toxicity that still exists in American society. Mm -hmm. So the fact that it happened is was absolutely terrible, tragic, and I think it made everyone sad, which is why you had the result, the the response that you mm -hmm. had. You know, a black guy was basically murdered in front of cameras, mm -hmm. right? And the police officer who did it, he just felt so entitled that and had just no conception in his mind that he was doing something wrong that he just felt fully liberated to he do this on camera oh okay right mm -hmm. it's not as if he, the guy was like shot in a back alley where no where there were no witnesses mm -hmm. there were there was literally people around with filming. their phones out and this guy proceeded to basically kill someone on camera okay so when it comes to that officer you know obviously i think there's really no way to describe it other than him just being a murderer but he was following instructions and many people said and that I, I don't I, I don't. watched the online trial on YouTube yeah. because they showed it online and there was a lot of um, things when people say that actually he died on the way to hospital he didn't die like in that moment plus he was on drugs he he died not from this so, asphyxiation so or I'll something. put it this way I think when you're trying to answer a lot of these questions or what if or mm. but this but that but this you generally want to try your best to be objective mm -hmm. and say okay of course let's just take race out of it completely mm -hmm. should a police officer ever do what this guy did to someone who is clearly not resisting mm -hmm. and should an interaction uh, between a private citizen who maybe he may may not be a criminal he may whatever should an interaction between a private citizen that is unarmed mm -hmm. not fighting back and a police officer should it end with that citizen dying forget race forget anything else like There is no way I think that answer can come back yes. Of course. <laughs> that an interaction between a police officer and a private citizen where there's no weapons, the guy's not fighting you back, should end with that guy being dead. The George Floyd thing, the fact that this happened, it's a tragedy. The police officer, I think he committed an act of cold blood so and murder. So he's murderer. He, uh, for sure. Mm -hmm. Is it an issue with the police system? Absolutely. Okay. Is it an issue with American society? Absolutely. And the fact that there was such a huge response in this Black Lives Matter movement happened and is happening. I think everyone, most, okay, I shouldn't say everyone, I should say the vast majority of mm -hmm. average Americans view this and absolutely feel that it is not acceptable. And to put it the most lightly way possible, politically, like, like mm -hmm. politically correct way possible. And it's a, it is a tragedy and it's embarrassing and it has to be fixed. Right? So then the question is, how do you fix this? And that's, I think, where this whole issue of people are becoming aware that there is this like toxic thing that still exists deep inside American society. And I think that the name we give it now is like systemic racism, mm -hmm. right? Where there's certain things about the quote unquote system that allows this still to happen, mm -hmm. right? Where you have police officers that are maybe not trained properly or you know if you want to say these are the reasons why you know there, there's an issue with the police force where there's an issue with systemic poverty among certain populations right that allows this kind of moment to happen and I think the vast majority of Americans black okay let's, let's say the vast majority I think of white Americans don't view themselves as racist and don't go about their daily lives mm -hmm. like trying to be racist assholes mm -hmm. you know the vast majority of people like just want this to go away mm -hmm actually mm -hmm. and I think it makes people and you know obviously black people know that this problem exists forever I think but well, you know for white people or actually any other just in general the population in general mm -hmm. I think there's kind of like a sickness that this shit still exists and that we still have to turn on the TV and see this stuff every day because you know people raise their kids and no one's raising their kids to be racist pricks or anything like this you know no one's raising their kids to hate other people but there's something systemic still inside American society where there's this racial tension. I think it would be hard to find anyone, black, or white, or whoever, who could comment on this, who, a serious person, a mm -hmm. fair, yeah. objective person, who could comment on, who can comment on race relations in the U.S. and not say that there are problems in the black community. Okay? I don't think anyone would, could, any serious person mm -hmm. would say that black people have don't have problems i mean yeah. this is ridiculous right you just like you said i mean there's obvious statistics that show that the black community in the u.s has big problems mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. i don't think anyone can say that it's, it's there's nothing wrong with black people they there's nothing none of this 
is a result of real issues and problems in the black community. I don't think the black life movement or a lot of the discourse mm -hmm. over the past year has been saying that, you know, black people have to get their shit together. I don't mm -hmm. think anyone's like denying that. I think the issue is why can in 21st century America, this George Floyd thing still happen, mm -hmm. right? You know, I, and I think there's a lot of noise and I always like to step back and just try to look at the, the clear facts, mm -hmm. right? And then in this day and age, police should not be killing people, unarmed people. Black, white, green, whatever. Whatever, Okay. Yeah. In this day and age, there should not be systemic issues that result in inequality, mm -hmm. okay? I would also be the first to say that in this day and age, there have been never more opportunities, equal opportunity for everyone mm -hmm. in the US, right? And that doesn't make it perfect. I'm just saying that, I'm just saying that today, if you're black, if you're white, if you're Hispanic, Asian, whatever, the playing field is more even now than it has ever been in the past. I'm not saying it's 100% level. No, I'm just course. saying it's more level now than any time even in the past. Even by gender, it's also. And I think that one of the great things about America, I mean, one of the things that makes me proud to be American is that even though we have this like toxic crap that happens on CNN and everyone in the world can see it and it's embarrassing even though we have this we in many ways actually I don't want to even say in many ways I just say I want to say we never stop trying to improve that playing field mm -hmm. right and that the conversation involved in leveling that playing field involves people saying okay cops need to be trained better and there is systemic racism and it also involves people saying like Black people shouldn't be 50% of the, of the crime stats mm -hmm. that you're talking about. And there are issues with inside, within the black community about mm -hmm. why, do we, why do black people not focus more on educating their kids. But, but, there's also the question is, why is health and fitness not a more pronounced uh, priority among black families, mm -hmm. right? So the point is, there's always two sides to the coin. There's always, there, the, I think I would be the one who says that the, le the playing field is not equal. There is syst are systemic issues mm -hmm. in terms of how the government allocates resources. But also there's much work to be done, I think, among black people to improve, to really work hard to improve their own situation, okay? And I think like from my experience growing up, one, ish, one thing that I was always taught is that no one's going to give you anything. And that whatever you want, you have to like just work really hard to get, right? But and, I, and, I think, okay. and I think that the idea of working harder to improve yourself, your family self, your community situation, I think that idea and that, um, that trend, mm -hmm. so to speak, needs to be improved. Okay. Among black people. One one more question. Yeah. L to finish the all the BLM shit yeah. because we have a lot of things to talk. If that policeman mm. was black man, mm. or if that George Floyd was, was a white. white one, yeah, would it have so big consequences? No. So people still, uh, someone still die. Yeah. But there is no consequences. No. I wouldn't say. Oh, I wouldn't say there are no consequences. Okay, no. I would. Not I would so say. Big consequences. It I would say it wouldn't result in the same outpouring yeah. of protests and all this stuff. Yeah, like black policemen would kill the white one. White lives matter will not have never no. happen. No, it's just like because because it's not about just this one thing. Yeah, yeah. Again, you know, it's about a systemic issue that I think people re recognize exists within society. Or just because it was shot in a camera. Okay. If, yeah. If it wasn't. If if this. If there wasn't. If this wasn't on Facebook, I don't think it would have exploded the way it did. I mean, this was a social media phenomenon. But what's your personal like feeling about the BLM thing? Like in a what's going on with the BLM right now when this like leader, this black girl, the leader of the BLM who bought a house in a like really trendy white district, you know, and uh, like used like shit enough money from BLM uh, sources mm -hmm. to buy a house in a white district to mm -hmm. live like a white people. And uh, with all this looting situation, with all those crazy riots, like, do you personally support like all this movement right now? Or in the beginning it was good and now something wrong happened? I absolutely support the big idea behind it, mm -hmm. which is 
like I said before, figuring out no, what... We're not talking about the idea. Idea is, well, like, the, even no, I support no, well, the well, idea, yeah, no, but see, that's I mean, the, the situation, like, exactly what is happening right now. Because, like, feminism is also basically an amazing idea of equality of the genders. Mm. But what's happening with feminism right now, when, like, you're being a masculine person, like, from the day you're born in their eyes, making you already the oppressor. I'll put it this way. Whenever you are trying to change society mm -hmm. and you have a large movement with millions of people, it's never going to be clean. Of course. <laughs> right? It's never going to be black and white. Not, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, you know, it's, it's a movement by, it's a movement towards an ideal being uh, pushed forward by imperfect people. It's imperfect people trying to head towards a more perfect union and obviously there's going to be all kinds of side stories and drama mm -hmm. about this is what the looting happened here. This chick's buying like a really nice house in a white neighborhood here. There's always going to be side stories that mm -hmm. are distractions because people are imperfect and move. And when you get an, indivi an individual is imperfect, when you get the hundreds of thousands and millions of people trying to accomplish something together, coordination and execution is going to be imperfect. And there's always going to be aha moments where you can point to someone and be like, look at this. Yeah. Right. But again, the ideal, is correct. Mm -hmm. The direction that we're moving, if you, I'll put it this way, is the, is American society better now because of the Black Lives Movement as opposed to two years ago? I would say yes. Okay. okay. I would say that. I would say it has improved awareness. It has made people think. And it has really started, again, kind of forced a soul searching of American mm -hmm. culture and American society. I think throughout American history, periods of turbulence, periods of disagreement mm -hmm. when we survive them it makes the union stronger. I mean one of the mottos of the US is a more perfect union, right? The US is a country of immigrants. The US is a multiracial country and it is a country where everyone is from somewhere else and it's really hard to throw people into a pot and expect everyone to get along, right? But I think one of the most powerful things about the United States and I think one of the things that makes most Americans very proud of the US is the fact that we can have problems, we can have civil uh, issues, we can have disagreements, we can have violence, but as a society we, come, we still survive and in general in the past historically mm -hmm. we've come out stronger at the end of it. So I think that's a so long-term impact of this. Long-term impact is a net positive, right? I think I think it's just like just it will like not create a new wave of racism when people like I'm a owner of like some convenience store and sitting in my convenience store and some like guys who screaming that their life matters just looting my store. Of course, it will like raise up a little bit racism sure. in me. For sure. So there will be. Yeah. But I'm talking about 350 million. And my family. I'm, like I'm, I'm talking about 330 million people. I'm talking about American society. Mm -hmm. Beer. <laughs> <laughs> God bless Mexico. Yes. <laughs> but anyway, today is the 4th of July. It Congratulations for the big, you, big thing. Thank you. Yeah. God always, bless America. Always a good day. Yeah, always always a, good a good day. What's your level in beer pong? Their levels? I don't know. Oh. People ask the question, oh. what's your level? How you feel it? Like what? I have to say recently, I'm not at the top of my game. Okay. Unfortunately, yeah, I'm, out of, I'm out of practice. Okay. Uh, but I think at my peak, when I was college. like maybe 23, no, after college. Okay, after college. When I was like 23, 24, it was probably my best beer pong days. I was quite good. I was okay. quite good. And, and the only way you know if you're good is just if you're winning. There's no like universal beer pong so scale. So how often he was winning? Uh, every weekend. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Anyway, let's move yeah. from our racial thing yeah. to sexual thing oh, okay the thing that actually i have no idea why i really have no clue but really interesting for russian people lgbtq plus thing <laughs> we are in july right now uh -huh. the pride month is over first thing that no one asked in the comments it's my personal thing uh -huh. pride is one of seven synth uh -huh. since uh -huh. how come uh -huh. you have a month that actually made for one of major seven scenes. Uh -huh. Where is the gluttony month? Uh -huh. Where is the <laughs> envy month? Uh <-huh. laughs> what are, what's going, why pride? <laughs> I think this is a classic 
Diva taking a word and twisting it into <laughs> something <laughs> and trying to make it into a sneaky question. <laughs> okay, that, it was just a joke. You know, anyway. I know you too well to yeah. even like try to Inter answer. Reactive, <laughs> answer yeah. Whatever. Uh. The question is, where is the limit of uh, common sense? Ah, that's a very good question. And I, I don't know the answer okay. to that question, to be honest. Sometimes I also ask myself this. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the limit to common sense? And what can be too much? Mm -hmm. And I think it's kind of like one of those things you know it when you see it. Let's separate these two things. Uh, okay, okay. What you think in like what's going on yeah. right now and how it came to what we have right now. Uh, and second thing, what's your personal opinion about this? Okay, For the first is what's going on right now is it's one of those things that it's a movement that is gaining traction because there's a significant sizable or, or vocal section of the population that thinks this should be an issue. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think one of the challenges of open democratic societies is that when there is a group of people that can scream loud enough mm -hmm. or that group of people is big enough mm -hmm. they have to be addressed or heard you know democracy is the marketplace okay this is an ideal st idealistic statement mm -hmm. but democracy should be the marketplace of ideas right where the government responds to the ideas that exist within your society and the government reflects mm -hmm. those attitudes and viewpoints that exist in your society uh, and obviously there is always a role that the government shapes those attitudes and roles but uh, there's always the hope or the long term the government's supposed to reflect mm -hmm. the will desire and viewpoints of its people that's just the definition of right course. so now when you have a segment of your population that feels a certain way about gender identity the whole gender identity movement is just an out is just a result of it has become an important issue for a significant percentage or a significantly loud <laughs> section of the population. Mm -hmm. I don't think I can say whether that should happen or shouldn't happen. It, mm -hmm. is, it is happening, right? So you, and the government, government actions and our politicians have to reflect mm -hmm. that. Does that mean that everyone agrees on this? Does that mean everyone in the U.S. thinks that all this stuff, for instance, with passports and stuff, is normal and should be happening? Of course, no, right? But I, I, th I would say that on a, a high level, we should never deny this movement to happen because mm -hmm. again there's a significantly large or significantly loud percentage of the population that wants this to be an issue mm -hmm. so it has to be addressed it can't just be there's a you know when you when you ask me is gender identity is this a bad thing i would say absolutely no because it's just the government reflecting the will of the people or a significantly critical mass will of the people now if you ask me, do you think this is normal? Would you want your kid to do this? Like, do you think the rest of the world should accept this as normal? No. Okay, because it's not something that I am like really like pushing for. So like, everyone just have to use their own brains to think. And that's, we're all grown ups, right? Use your own brain to that's, think like, no, this no, is. That's exactly a point of my question. Huh. I'm not, you know, like grown ups. Yeah. Like in my personal opinion. Yeah. Can do self distraction in any possible way they want right. no one should have any fucking right to say to open their mouths and say them how to live their own yeah, life yeah, yeah. we talking about the kids yeah because the biggest impact well, it, like, what like, happens it's making for kids and like does people oh. like you're from us so we're talking about the us have to have a right to raise their kids in the way of the, their the, personal craziness yeah, yeah. Why? That's, like, what, that's, that's the definition of being a parent, right? You no, raise your kid according... You have a laws where government can take your kid from course, family when you're course, drunk or course, beating of something. Of course, of course. But this but kind the, of the idea... Yeah, all your arguments always use the same tactic, which is take something to an extreme and apply it to normal people. I will normal people... Normal, wait, wait, wait. Normal people raise their normal kids. Normal people have very run-of-the-mill vanilla viewpoints about a lot of things, right? And normal people generally like espouse or teach their kids to behave in very normal ways right now no 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 you can say there's some people that want their kids to think that you know it's totally normal to want to change your gender when you're a teenager mm -hmm. right and if that is something that they want to do and that they feel if their kid comes to them and tells them i think i should like who am i to say it's the same thing with any other argument who am i to be like 
You're a parent. Yeah, for my kids, not for their kids. No, 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 for your yeah, own. Yeah, for my yeah. kids. Of yeah. course, you cannot talk to so other people. My point is, like, I don't, I don't really, to be honest with you, about all these questions. I don't spend a lot of time thinking about these yeah, issues. Yeah, of course. Right? What I do spend my time thinking about is, is the way that we react as a society good or bad? Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, is the government reacting in a way that reflects what people want? Yes. Is this movement something that reflects what I would want for my kids? No. Mm -hmm. Right? And in terms of this whole toxic thing of like if the US society accepts, you know, all this kind of like gender transitions and gender identity uh, movement, is that toxic for the rest of the world? And I guess my only answer to that is, is raise mm. your own kids. Yeah. It's up to you, right? If you, don't, if you don't want your kids to watch Netflix, don't let them watch Netflix, right? And that's, that's any social movement is like that. There's always a tension between your values as a parent and society's values. And how much do you try to push your kids towards or away from society's values, right? Mm -hmm. that's, just, that's just part of raising kids, right? And that's part of uh, allowing your kids to consume certain ideas or not. I don't think America, I think most powerful aspects or where America draws a lot of its power from is its ability to influence s the rest of the world in terms of ideas. Um, I think that's extremely powerful. And that's like one of the things where separates the U.S., I think, from a lot of other great powers is the, its ability to package or to export ideas mm -hmm. and the willingness of other people to accept them as that's trendy. That's propaganda. Normal. No, no, it's not called propaganda. It's not called propaganda. No, you take the, taking basically some idea of no, no, some no, no, group no. of I, people. No, 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 no. Watching a show on Netflix is not propaganda. Watching a show on Netflix that espouses gender identity, gender transitions is I not propaganda. I disagree with no, you completely. No, Netflix is, I guarantee you, Netflix did not spend whatever, 100 million, 500 million, 1 billion, whatever, in content creation because they have a mission to spread propaganda. Again, I think, wait, wait, let me finish, because this is really important. Netflix board of directors is not sitting around trying to decide how to spread gender identity propaganda. Netflix, wait, 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 wait. Next, Netflix's creative team are not sitting around trying to figure out how to espouse certain ideas. All of them are trying to figure out how to make money. And so they're going to create content mm -hmm. that people want to watch. So if you see more and more of this content toxic content on your netflix stream it's because you're fucking watching it or it's because millions of other people are watching it and so people all these media companies that everybody in the rest of the world likes to call propaganda i don't get it because i really don't think there's propaganda there is supply and demand no, and when there is demand when there listen listen when there is demand for a product mm -hmm. when there is demand for an idea when we're gonna make more of it because you can make money from it and yeah. if there is not a demand, but you think there should be demand, you can try to, you can try to create demand for okay. a new market, a, new, a whole new genre of content revolving around queer people. Okay. Right? You just made another billion dollars to your bottom line. The point is, that decision is not being driven by some, I need to create propaganda to espouse the notions of gender transitions. No. It's like I'm trying to make money, and when I made, this, when I made the last TV series about some queer couple, you know, a gajillion people in Europe watched it. So I'm going to make another one. And then you come around and say, oh, this is American propaganda. It's not American propaganda. It's American stock market. It's people making money. Okay. I, will say, I will tell you my point of view. The, the, it's a little bit more complex. Because you know what is like native commercial? Yes. Ads inside the content. Yes. When especially the most interesting and cool native commercials, mm. when people don't even plan to do any commercial, like yeah. if I, I have a bottle of Corona, yeah, you put, in yeah, here. You put it on the camera, yeah, 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 yeah. no one sponsored yeah, it, yeah, yeah, I will yeah. not get anything yeah, from yeah. this. But now I showed Corona, yeah. it will affect someone, yeah, yeah. Actually, amazing cold Corona beer, <laughs> it's a part of propaganda, and of course, you're absolutely right that there is no group in Netflix who's sitting and thinking about the propaganda. Mm. It works. We're in 21st century. It doesn't work like this. It's like war is not winning by tanks anymore. Nobody need rockets to win war. You need stable internet and nice PR team to win the war. 21st century wars and propaganda is not like throwing the newspapers in the territory of the North Korea with the news of something like or with new, new North Korea maybe it still works but in any other well-developed country 
someone setting up the trend, the trend setter setting up the trend, and the rest of the people, some of them by their own will, some people just because they want to be a part of this trend, they starting to spread this yeah. trend. And that's the part of propaganda. You're not a general of this propaganda, not the leader. You're a soldier of propaganda. And sometimes you don't even know what you're doing, that you are spreading propaganda. And spreading like American trends, it's a, just a new level, new way, 21st century, more smart, more deep way of spreading like propaganda. And any country want to do this. Only one country success is America in this. And you're absolutely right that US is really, really like perfect in like well zipping and packing their thoughts and views, like point of views and throwing it to the rest of the world. That's okay. Everybody want to do this. Believe me, if Russian government have all those instruments and understanding how it works, they will do the same exactly, just Russian point of view. It's still propaganda. One thing I don't understand, take some, I don't know, some famous uh, white actor and make movie him playing Martin Luther King. Tomorrow this studio will be destroyed by riots, looters and everyone and by society and internet. But blackwashing became normal and all of those movies have super low ratings, super low box office. Why people don't want to create something new? I remember like a Blade movie mm. or like a Luther TV show. Mm. And there is like hundreds of amazing black actors who play in fucking great roles in a great movies with a great scripts. And that's absolutely normal. Mm. We love Denzel Washington because he's a great actor, not because he played some uh, white man so good. Why all this happens? They losing a lot of money. It's some long term investment. What is this? why people losing because in america money is always on the top of everything and why people keep losing money keep doing shit not creating new products new ips mm. but taking the old ips and then black washing it then switching the male roles to females and all this shit. where creativity where it's disappeared why it's all happens and why they keep losing money just to do that shit mm -hmm. why I was like waiting for the question. They're like building up the question. Yeah, no, yeah. the question is just why. The, the question that really is the end is why are there bad ideas? I don't know. People come up with bad ideas. I'm not, I, I, none of these companies are in aggregate, in total, losing money. They have bad shows. It happens, right? For every one bad show, they have three good shows and they make money. So I don't know. The question is why do they have bad ideas and come up with bad shows? I don't know. I have no, no idea. I, I'm more my curious point is, about like all these... Um, <laughs> trends for it's like not a, a trend if it were a trend they'd be making money that's my point hmm. right it's like no, it's they're not, trying it, to create no but trend. they're failing so it's not a trend this is the thing if you try to do something but why they fail, keep doing it they you know you have to you have to try lots of different ideas okay. right and if it was actually a trend they wouldn't be losing money so i think what you're saying is you're, you're pointing out examples of flops mm -hmm. of bad TV shows that have bad have black actors that shouldn't be black and you're saying why is this a trend and my argument is it's not a trend because they're losing money and they're they're, they're failing so I, I know you're kind of answering your old questions by making the question it's like it's not a trend because they're failing if it, if it were succeeding they would totally be a, a trend right but there is some show that succeeds yeah and those are the trends and if you want to ask me about the successful show, that's a different question. But you're asking me about shows that flopped and they okay about the successful. So what's, what about them? Like, why are they successful? I don't know because they're giving people what they want. Okay, that's the definition of successful the content. It's like your channel is successful because you're giving people something interesting that they care. So about. the basic point is like no one forcing you to watch it. Yeah. This. <laughs> Okay. And the fact that they fail means no one's watching it. The last half hour was 20 minutes of you asking me a question. Yeah. Was you asking me a question? I will cut it. What do you think or what do you say when every day, like you see first time yourself in a mirror? Every morning. There, when must, you wake. there must be a God. <laughs> oh, <shit>. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, there who must, created this, this program? Could, this could not happen by accident. <laughs> You know, so this is the thing, you know, so many people talk about is there God, is there not? I mean, my understanding is very simple. When I wake up in the morning and I look in the mirror, I'm like, 
there must be a God and he must love me. And actually, this shit doesn't happen by accident. This question was more complex uh -huh. because people actually asked uh, exactly about this. Does Americans really like it's stereotype or what? Yeah. Uh, thinking how awesome I am, like when they see uh, themselves in the morning in the mirror. Is this a stereotype, really? It's a stereotype, really? yeah, about US, yeah. Like, I don't know, I think, so I think... much selfish and love yourself, guys. <laughs> I don't know if it's about being selfish, it's just about being comfortable. With yourself. With yourself, <laughs> with yourself. That's you know? basically what means selfish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> People interested about one actually pretty cool thing. Uh. Kids in the US, when you were, when you was a kid, uh, when you study history lessons, mm -hmm. uh, what kind of history lessons you study? Like, I, I will try to explain what I mean. I mean, like, is there a, all about like, we are a great nation, we won every war. What's about like Iraq? What's about like Vietnam? What's about Second World War? When the kids study in there, mm -hmm. what kind of truth you study in a... No, no, no. I mean, everyone in every country, let's be honest trying to show their country as in a m maximum best way. Mm -hmm. In Russia, when you study, people say that we won Second World War. Mm -hmm. And of course, in America, it must be something like this. Like, what exactly kids study? Like, not nowadays, even in your time, mm -hmm. whatever. You know, I think America, all American school kids study world history. You have to study European history, world history in general, obviously American history. Mm -hmm. um, you know, American history, I would say, probably is the most slanted because uh generally actually i don't even know if it's that slanted but the point is like you said any there's always a slight uh, tilt mm -hmm. mm, to history lessons right so I, I think there's an old saying it's like winners always write the history books of course right? <laughs> losers never get to write the history yes. books so winners always write the history books so you know in in school, I mean, are you asking about specific like, events? Yeah, because mostly people, of course, interested about like this most, let's say, gray zone. Mm -hmm. It's a Vietnam War. Ah, it's a Iraqi, like all the Middle Eastern conflicts, yeah. where people thinking like you went there just because of oil, mm -hmm. and of course, Second World War. Mm. World War Two, I think it's taught not only in the U.S. but in the West in general as. You know, the Allies won the war. But who, who included in the Allies? Russia is included. Russia is included in so the Allies. But when you study of there... Of, co of, course, of course, I'll put it this way. There's a lot more emphasis on D-Day and, and storming Normandy mm -hmm. than there is about the Battle of Stalingrad, right? Yeah. There's but a lot more still, emphasis. Of course, it's in the history book. Of course, of course. Everybody knows about Stalingrad. Everybody knows about, you know, Hitler's push into Russia. But there's a lot more... I, th I would say there's a lot more words written Mm. about the Western Front, let's okay. put it that way. But still, it's, it's mentioned. It's not mentioned, it's highlighted. It's, I, mean, I think it would be really difficult to ignore the Eastern Front in mm. World War I or World War II. Vietnam? Vietnam is shown as generally a failure mm. in American foreign policy. I don't think any textbook would say clearly that like, the US lost Vietnam. Just like I don't think any textbook written in the next 10 years will say the US lost in Afghanistan. But I think it was definitely viewed as a failure. Like, mm -hmm. you didn't win, for sure, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, Vietnam generally, like, I mean, it's hard, it would be really difficult to try to spin Vietnam in a positive light. It was an extremely huge loss of capital, people, equipment, and um, I don't think anyone really says the U.S. won Vietnam. And what's an excuse? It's actually a question for me. Uh. What's an excuse from government to normal American people uh, when spending another few hundred billions on uh, like defense, mm. yeah, on the military shit, like because uh, America have the biggest budget for uh, defense in the world, mm. and like what's an always an excuse? Like people doesn't think that maybe all this threat from Middle East is actually created to keep these budgets flowing, you know, to the pockets, because all the companies who produce the weapon, weaponry and uh, military budget is not just weapons. It's a lot of medical stuff, a lot of electronics, a lot of everything. So all those companies are private, mm -hmm. all belong, not belong to government, like 100% are private. Mm -hmm. And if tomorrow there will be no wars, no such a threat, they will lose just billions, hundreds of billions. So 
nobody, there is no conversations in the society about that. Of course there are. Of course there are. And that's, I think every presidential election, defense spending is, a, or the defense budget and our defense policies are big issues in any presidential election. And I think in Congress, or I mean, in, in politics in general, defense is huge. It's, 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 if not the biggest, I think the biggest is Medicare. But, but I think behind Medicare are just basically social spending on mm -hmm. like healthcare, social security. Defense is the biggest part of the budget. Uh, so I, there's always discussion about that. Yeah, I, think, I don't think you can spend close now to $800 billion a year without having a discussion about yeah. it. Yeah, because this number is insane. Mm. There is no such a threat in the world for $800 billion <laughs> a year. Like once I can understand, but every 365 days, 800. It's like over a billion, like almost two billions per day yeah. to keep thinking that everyone is your enemy. Russia is your enemy. Uh, China is your enemy. Middle East is your enemy. Okay, well, and see, again, you start with one question and then start making statements that aren't really a question. Because that's because how you, I see this. No, 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 because you start with asking, it's like, is there a discussion about the size of the U.S. defense yeah. budget? No, and I started, say, and I say, of course there's a discussion. We started from history lessons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, that's the point, because uh, is there any discussion about, like, what's happened in Iraq, Iraq or Afghanistan? Of course. There's always another side. <laughs> So, so the discussion. But is it possible to see a new wave of like hippies like in 70s no, after? I don't think so. No, no. In general, mm. American society, how is politically active or passive in a, like normal society? How they like accept the elections time? They thinking about like government things about like involved in some. I think recently, the last couple of years, it's been government policies have been on everyone's mind because of the coronavirus. Mm -hmm and how the government is responding to the coronavirus, how the government's trying to stimulate the economy mm -hmm. after the coronavirus, right? So the government has been extremely active in these last couple of years, right? Uh, in terms of, in general, how active or apathetic are people with regards to government, I would say that more and more, like generally, I mean, the trend is younger people are generally more apathetic and don't care so much about government. Um, but maybe that'll change these, uh, these next couple of years because I think people understand, people are seeing very clearly when there's, that there is a role for government. Mm. You mentioned one really big thing that I want to talk about, coronavirus, mm -hmm. of course. It's like on everyone's mind for two years already. Yeah. First, of course, just interesting. Everyone like, should have their opinion about this. What do you think? Where it came from? Natural lab or anything? Ooh, oh, oh, oh. Like a personal <laughs> thing. No, we, we need to mention that question. we are not professional. We just yeah. chatting, you know? Yeah. So I would say that I try with this question. I've tried to do some research, actually. Mm. I've tried to like, understand why would people say it came from a lab? What, what are the indicators? Um, that would cause like professional, like really like distinguished professional scientists mm -hmm. to just throw it out there that this maybe came from a lab. What's Look, according to their arguments, I suspect it came from a lab. Based on what I've read so far, I mean, I could read something different tomorrow and it's going to be different. There is a but, point. But, but what I've seen, mm -hmm. I think it's I think it's possible and likely that it came from a lab but because of a couple okay. reasons. One, the information that I've seen, mm -hmm. which anyone can see, everyone can go online and research this. And two is the government, the Chinese government's reaction. Okay. I'm a big believer if you don't have anything to hide, why would you hide some, you know? So the fact that there's such a lockdown about the origins of the coronavirus in China on top of information that points to the fact that it is possible and somewhat likely mm -hmm. that it happened in a lab, together those two things make me think that it came out of a lab. So uh, there is another like conversation in a society right now, especially in the internet. Mm. Okay if it came out of the lab mm. like if we agree with that concept was it on purpose or was it an accident i would very strongly suspect that it was an accident so like there was no very strongly bad suspect. things behind no it. i'm pretty sure you know if, if you say if i were to t walk through the lab leak story i would say these guys very very good scientists very innocent scientists going about their business doing research in a lab and someone, maybe somewhere, didn't follow a protocol and got sick and let, and let it out. Okay. I mean, it's, it, you don't have to be evil to have this accident happen, right? I think they were doing normal work mm -hmm. that 
is conducted in labs in like level four labs around the world. Mm -hmm. And actually one of the reasons this is stuff was being researched in China is because we didn't want it being done in the US. So it's like you have level four coronavirus research being done and they, you know, they call it gain of function research, basically modifying the virus to figure out if you can make it more, um, like help it basically infect, improve the rate with which it can infect people, mm -hmm. right? It's called gain of function research. So they got these bat coronaviruses from China, because this is where all the coronaviruses yeah. are. They put them in a lab and then they start poking the virus to basically try to make it more dangerous. And then somehow it got out. I, I would suspect this is exactly mm -hmm. what happened. Either it got out in a person or like maybe one of the rats or whatever bats they were testing mm -hmm. it on got out. I can, you can totally imagine it happening. Yeah, and yeah. then you can totally imagine the government wanting to just But what do you down. think like if, if one day Chinese yeah. government, then they will, of course, they will never do, uh, let yeah. this happen. Yeah. But if they will agree that it was an ex lab accident, how big consequences Huge. it could be? Because everybody will always wants someone to blame. It's like right? a, you become the world's enemy. Yeah, the because whole world like, let's enemy. put it this way. Human beings, just like psychologically, we are almost forgiving of natural disasters, mm -hmm. right? But an earthquake comes and destroys your city, mm -hmm. there's no one to blame. But if someone nukes your city, you're going to nuke them back. Right? There's rage because now you have a, someone to blame. And if it ever turns out, and this is why China would never want this to happen, mm -hmm. if it ever turns out that through incompetence <laughs> at a level four laboratory in Wuhan, China, a global pandemic started, everyone's going to blame China. Mm. Regardless of whether, I mean, there's no reason to blame them, actually. It's just human nature. You know, the, 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 you know, the counter argument can never be, well, sorry, guys, accidents happen. Mm -hmm. That would never make anyone feel good, even of though course. that's really just what happened, you know? Okay, let's move from like all these political, historical things to the real life. Mm -hmm. One subscriber asked, just reading, like yeah. quoting him, yeah. how white heterosexual male uh -huh. can survive in modern America? Wow, wow, I think they're surviving and thriving. <laughs> <laughs> All of my straight white male friends aren't really, you know, struggling. struggling <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but, but this, but you know, I understand the question though, mm -hmm. because there's so there's a there's a again a vocal percentage of the population that feels as if they're being attacked, right? Mm -hmm. And I get that totally. Like, you know, for every reaction, you know, reaction there's a reaction, right? So. If, you know, if you have a, this Black Lives Matters movement, mm -hmm. invariably there are gonna be people who feel like they're being attacked, mm -hmm. right? They're gonna be people who be like, well, white lives matter too, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, right? But yes. you cannot say all lives matter. Yeah, yeah. You cannot do this. But the, 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 the You basically have no rights right now to <laughs> say all lives yeah, matter. Yeah, yeah. That's actually only one common sense truth. Yeah, so I guess the only thing I can say is I understand that there's any time there's a movement, there's a counter movement. And I think we definitely see that, especially on the internet, you yeah. see the counter movement where people will find every little like stupid thing about the Black Lives Movement and like point yeah, it out, right? And every and then you have guys in Russia, yeah. basically asking like, how would a white heterosexual male survive? It's like okay, of the course, fact you also understand that it's kind of it's a kind joke. of a ridiculous question, yeah. but it reflects a real concern, you know. And plus, it reflects another thing: how people see your country from outside, mm. like what kind of face you have from outside, because. From outside, like from my country, when I'm reading Russian news and news from other countries, all what I see that the most big racists right now mm. are people from BLM. Yeah, yeah. The most big sexists are people from feminist yeah, movements. Yeah, yeah. It's the, yeah. And they all bringing everything to extreme. You're yeah. saying like, I'd like to do extreme examples. Right, right, right. No, because when I see people who fighting for equality, actually they not they don't want any fucking equality. They want only their truth to become new normal. Right, right, right. right. And you know, you're absolutely right. And again, you know, with any movement, with any political party, there's always an extreme element. Yeah. And usually that is that extreme moves the rest of the society like a little bit more in their direction. But the rest of society doesn't become as extreme as them, right? And then any movement, it's not nor the normal average people doing it. It's the people on the far thing and they're kind of like pulling everybody else a little bit more but in that direction. Seeing all these extreme people because they're most loud, I think it's just raising the level of the hate. I don't think so. No? Nah, I don't think so. They will in just a, say, open in, in a society, in any society, in a, but especially in the US, there is, there is turbulence, mm -hmm. there's disagreement. And there happens to be periods in time when that disagreement goes up. And I would say that right now in American society, there is more uh, disagreement, more polarity, 
and than in recent history. Yeah, because many, even American news, I'm watching sometimes, even CNN I'm watching, it's a shithole. Mm. But even uh, watching it sometimes and see that everyone admits that America really never, never been polarized like yeah. like this before. Yeah. So, so I don't think, I, don't, I think the, the current situation is not normal. Mm -hmm. I think the current situation is a historical moment. Mm -hmm. And I think things No will, civil war? No. I think things will get back to n more normal in the coming decade. Okay, okay. But okay. It's, not the it's not the first time this has happened in the US mm. and it for sure won't be the last time. Interesting question mm. about the black people. <laughs> because I didn't mention anywhere that you are like black. Okay. Yeah, I just said my friend uh, from US. Uh. So no one knew. And I, I especially decided to do like this okay. because people can more openly ask some questions. They don't want to be rude, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. because if they know that you're black, they will not ask some questions yeah, because yeah. like maybe you're sensitive or something. <laughs> I know who you are. It's okay. <laughs> so African-American mm. living in China, mm. I know more Africans, black Africans and few African-Americans, including you. Right. Why you call yourself African-Americans? Because except the skin color, mm. you have nothing in common with those people. Like zero, literally fucking zero in common with those people. When I'm talking to like a black person from Africa, it's a person from one planet. When I'm talking with any American, I'm first talk to American, Asian American, black American, white American, doesn't matter. I first, first I see like American culture. Mm. And then after like all American, like skin, the, <laughs> I see already the color of your actual skin. Because yeah. American people spread America 24-7, <laughs> wherever they live. <laughs> you can, like Russians, you can see them from far yeah, away. Yeah. And Africans are completely different. Yeah. Plus, Africa is not a country. It's a, a huge amount of countries yeah. that actually well, also I think I think the answer is in your question. You, know, you named African Americans, Asian Americans, uh, white Americans. I mean, it's just a naming convention. Okay. It's so just, I mean, the, the, the there is nothing anymore stands behind no, that. No, no. Really just, just a naming. Yeah. Okay. Because all the black people, in the, they just came from Africa at some point, right? Mm, Caribbean. Yeah, but that's the thing. In the beginning, it was all from Africa. Oh, so okay. it's, it just, it's like a name. It's just stuck, like African-American. Okay, okay. Yeah. Because why not call just, okay, make a new normal. Like, yeah. we are living in a certain point where we're creating yeah, yeah, yeah. new I th normal for everything. I think actually everything. there is a movement to do that also, yeah, to yeah. call it like Black Americans. Yeah, Black Americans. To stop making Black okay, Americans black? be inco like Men. Right, and just, that's the thing. There's like a movement now to... S like make black Americans like more politically corrected African Americans. And that was another question. Because like like you just said, they're like, well, black people come from the Caribbean and all this stuff. I don't know. It's just a naming. And it's another one of those things I don't really spend a lot of time thinking yeah. about because you just grow up with it. And you're like, you're African American. It's like the name for black. It's like the politically correct name for black people, right? Let's talk about the color. Okay. The question was, it's from there. Uh -huh. Where is this border between <laughs> white and non-white? <laughs> Because there is a lot of black people who have whiter skin than yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. They're just face shaped like uh, yeah. African. And this is actually a unique thing to the US, I think. Like in the US, we generally say like if you're like just part something, you're that thing, you know? Like so if you're like if you're if you're like if you if you're half black, half white, you're black. Okay. You know? So if you have a drop of something non whiteness inside yeah, and of it you, shows and it shows that you're that thing. Yeah, you know? okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, I don't know why again, yeah, I don't know why that is, but it's just kind of like and Otherwise, there is another thing, like uh, also people ask, and yeah. we slowly, slowly come to the last part of our okay. conversation to Russia. Okay. As a tech guy, uh. what's your opinion? What's going to be like next iPhone? I mean, next big thing, like next big invention, next big product. Ooh, that's a big one. And the, the reason it's difficult is because I don't think anyone can accurately predict, predict a specific product mm -hmm. you can just maybe look, technology right you can just you can just look at what like what the trends are and what mm -hmm. the waves are right and now there is a huge amount of discussion about artificial intelligence mm -hmm. right and i think a lot of it is overblown okay in terms of people getting scared about you know ai taking over because actually ai really is not that smart what makes ai amazing is its ability to help us automate repetitive work. Okay, yeah. And kind of like mid-level management work that people do, like shuffling around Excel mm -hmm. and stuff. AI is amazing as it is now. It's not, it can, I mean, look at AI self-driving cars. They suck, yeah. right? So AI right now, its challenge, its difficulty is its inability to match human judgment 
when you have unpredictable situations. Yep. Okay. But where AI is awesome is pattern recognition. Okay. Yes. So AI can learn from vast amounts of data and and recognize patterns and then apply those that pattern recognition to new data. Right? So if it sees a certain amount of like, you know, if it can find a signal in the noise, it can find that signal over and over and over again, which is something that a lot of human mid-level management paper pushing work involves. Okay. Just learning from the past and applying it to when you get new data. So, so get I ready for the next wave of people who lose in their yeah. jobs. I think for sure AI is, autom is going to automate a lot of people's jobs. And people, when they think about that, they think about robots and factories. Mm -hmm. But I think actually it's going to automate a lot of white collar, just office jobs. Mm -hmm. A lot of repetitive stuff. I found one more question about the <laughs> coronavirus. Uh, and actually that's like serious question mm. without jokes. What do you think about the nearest future and the, like all the travel restrictions and everything when we have a little bit more freedom? In and out of China? Like for general. us in China and in general, oh. like for me is important about China yeah. and f in general, of course. Yeah, I think in general, pretty soon, actually. I think between, like, like I'll put it this way, between Europe, US, even Russia, like I think travel, re I think travel restrictions will be lifted like later this year. Okay. Um, I just, it's just, yeah, it's just a matter of like the, how many people get vaccinated. Right? Our golden cage went open? Not till next year, for sure. I think another year of this. Well, another year. Yeah. Okay. I think, yeah, I think China, China, the issue is just math. China issue is a paranoia. No. Government's no, paranoia. No, but yeah, for a reason though. Yeah, yeah, of course. Because they have zero immunity here, right? So if you look at Russia, if you look at the US, there is large percentage of the population that is a, was infected mm -hmm. and is therefore immune. And then you have an increasing percentage of your population that's getting vaccinated. Say, and the same in Europe, right? So you generally are approaching herd immunity, right? even with all these other variants mm -hmm. running around. In, in China, there's zero herd immunity and they, their vaccine is 60% effective. So even if you vaccinate everyone tomorrow and open your borders, 40% mm -hmm. of your population is gonna have an issue. It's susceptible, right? But so, let's say to the people, yeah. should they vaccinate or no? Uh, the, the audience? Any, the, yeah, the audience. I would say the evidence strongly suggests that you should get vaccinated. Please go. We want borders to be open. Yeah. <laughs> I want to travel. No, not just because we want the borders to be open, just because uh, I believe that in general, the vaccines are safe. Uh, interrupt you for one stupid question. Mm. People asking, I, asking you. One subscriber, yeah. he was in US, uh -huh. and uh, he tried cookies with raisins and chocolate. And chocolate? Like, yes. Okay. And they were, they were super yummy. Uh -huh. But he always see memes where someone mentioned that uh, raising cookies is a super shit. Like people like joking about like, you eating cookie, you thinking it's with chocolate, but you, then you bite it and it's with raisin and like fuck that shit and throwing it away. Uh -huh. Why? What's wrong? What's happened in US with a ra cookie raisin, with raisin? Raisin cookies. Yes. I have no idea. Really? I've never heard anything bad about it. I love oatmeal raisin cookies are yeah. really good. Yeah, that's like I, oatmeal I, I, raisin I cookies. Not, I don't know any memes. Like you know chip? way more about memes than I do. Okay. I haven't seen any memes about oatmeal, like raisin cookies being Because he said that, bad. I also don't know, because yeah. that's why I asked you a question. Maybe it was some from cartoon no, or from some I, I don't know childhood thing. Before we move to Russia completely, I have like few random questions that I found like in comments under my video. And people ask, America always since like 90s, especially for us, for Russians who grew up in 90s, mm. it was a kind of like land of the dream, mm. land of possibilities. Is it like this right now? Is it like a land of freedom, a land of American dream, land of possibilities or not anymore for you personally? For me personally, absolutely it is. And I think that view has always been a little false because it is the land of possibility. It is there. We obviously cherish freedom. Everybody mm -hmm. knows this, but nothing ever comes easy. And I think there, as long as immigrants have been coming to America, there's always been this notion in people's minds that it's a place you can go and the kind of the streets are paved with gold a little mm -hmm. bit. It's easy to make a lot of money. Nothing's easy. America is one of the most competitive societies in the world. The economy is open and dynamic and that it is possible to you know, start a company, do a business, do something different, bring, make yourself the best at something. It's absolutely possible to make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. It's not easy. One more random question. Yeah. Why Americans love everything huge? 
gallons of milk, huge cars, yeah. like big size everything. Yeah. Why? Bigger is better, bro. Bigger is better. Bigger just is like better. I mean, that's just, what else do you want? I mean, how could that be a wrong statement? If you could tell me, like, if I could have it this size or if I could have more, why wouldn't I just have more? <laughs> like, you if have you a could, point. You if have you a could point. give me a cookie this big or give me a cookie this <laughs> big, like, I'll take the bigger cookie. Like, this isn't like rocket science. There's not some, like, deep, you know, psychological <laughs> meaning behind this. It's like, bigger is better. It's okay. like a bigger cookie is better than a smaller cookie. A bigger glass is better than a like a bigger french fry is better than a smaller... Privacy. Privacy okay. and personal freedom. Okay. In America, it's like absolute thing. Yeah. Like your personal freedom. Yeah. How to live in China with being person oh. who raised in the absolute freedom where privacy is everything? You have to just deal with it. You just have to realize you're not in Kansas anymore. I mean, you just, you just have to accept that this is where you are and this is the society you're in. And but in general, what do you I think? I mean, you're not going to change it. Mm. Right? Like, I'm not going to go out on the street and start talking to people that, you know, you should really value your personal privacy more. And mm -hmm. No, I mean, whatever. It's our, it's our view on things. China is different. You mm. just have to accept that if you're going to live here. Yeah. What do you think about all these Big Brother things? About the cameras, about yeah. the uh, Face ID, everywhere. Uh, everywhere. It's, okay, so the, if the question is, who is better at surveillance? Who is the leader in surveillance, mm. digital surveillance? I would say the U.S. by far. I would say who's good at hiding the fact that the leader in digital surveillance? I would say the, also the U.S. Because there's such pushback from people. Like people don't want to be surveilled, right? Mm -hmm. In China, like people don't really care that yeah. much. So the government can be pretty overt about it. Okay. The government can make it really obvious that they're Man, tracking you. I saw the underpass. Yeah, the, all the cameras, right? That, I counted. It's an underpass under fucking like four ways road. Right. It's 100 meter long. Yeah. And it, I counted there 27 cameras. Right. Yeah, I was saying in, you know, in China, I think the government isn't really trying to hide the fact that mm -hmm. they're tracking or surveilling their population. In fact, they want to make sure you know mm -hmm. that you're being watched. Whereas in the US, because of like strong feelings of in the population that they should have their privacy and security and not be spied upon, the government has to be really discreet about how it collects data. But where you feel more safe, more secure here or back in the US? Oh, that's a really tough question because I don't feel as feel unsafe anywhere, really. I don't feel, I don't feel like I have a reason to feel not safe. Okay, late night in the middle of the city, you're a bit tipsy. Oh, you mean in terms of like uh, violence yeah, or yeah. crime? Oh, China is very safe. China is definitely safer than the US by far. That's easy. <laughs> okay. Many people want to move to US. Mm. And how now, nowadays, people thinking about the immigrants and people who just newly moved from another country where they live in, in their neighborhood and then hear some like foreign accent mm. or something. What's the basic reaction? I think America now has been is more welcoming than ever before. Really? Yeah. I because it's built by immigrants. I yeah, thought like it but was I, always I think, I think, like you said, it's a country that's been built by immigrants. So immigration is like part of the DNA of the mm -hmm. US. And I, but I think because of all this like political correctness, Black Lives Matter, all this kind of stuff, like now like Americans feel as if they have to be like more, re welcoming. more welcoming, you okay. know, to immigrants. And of course, there's a, for sure, there's a segment of the population, like really like kind of like old white conservative guys who don't like immigrants. I mean, that always existed. Okay. That's always existed. But I think in general, it is the best time ever to be an immigrant in the US. Okay. Because the society, the society, society is, ready for you. is not only ready, but the society, there's a, the, a greater population of the society comes from immigrants now than any time before. America is a country that 100% built by capitalists. Mm -hmm why it's slowly, slowly becoming USSR, socialist country, all these social uh, ideas become more and more popular. Mm -hmm. Why it's happening right now? And like, don't you, don't, not just you, I mean, you in general, mm -hmm. people afraid that you will make the full circle from mm -hmm. like full capitalism, like reflect mm -hmm. with absolutely full socialism. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so the, for the first question, why? Um, socialist ideas are becoming more popular in mainstream political culture. Mm -hmm. I would say it's because of growing inequality mm -hmm. in the US. The richer have become richer, the poor have become poor relative to each other. Am I afraid that it's going to be full circle? No, because this has happened many times before in American history. It happens anytime that there's growing inequality. Mm -hmm. So, you know, lead up to in the 1920s. The rich got really rich, poor got really poor, and there was just growing movement for socialist ideas. Mm -hmm. Actually, the US did enact more socialist ideas like after World War II and stuff like that. Eventually, you kind of return 
to a more capitalist outlook. And I think nothing ever stays in a straight line. Mm -hmm. There's always ups and downs, right? But the average always kind of hangs out. And I feel like now we're at a point because of, I think it all has its, it stems from like the financial crisis back mm -hmm. in 2008, is that people lost a lot. The economy tanked. And it, even though the economy on paper has recovered, it's been a very unequal recovery. And now this point in American history, there's more equality than ever before. And there's more people working their asses off and still feeling poor. And when that happens, obviously socialist ideas become really popular, right? But it will never become like no, that. A, no new Lenin, no new Stalin, no, something like I, this. I would find that extremely unlikely because I think the other part of American DNA outside of socialist ideas is this idea of individual freedom. Okay. And I think it's impossible to go fully socialist without curtailing people's individual freedoms. And I think once your economic policies start messing around with people's life and how they can live their life, mm -hmm. it's a step too far. Life in US in one phrase. In just like one line. Every day I'm hustling. Now let's move to the final part, the like dessert, mm -hmm. Russia, of mm. course. My Russian subscribers, me Russian. Yeah. It's most interesting for yeah. us. If I come to US yeah. and say to the average person, Russia, yeah. what will come to the person's mind? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> just like that. Ooh, Russia. Like this is a little, this is a little dangerous. It's just, it's like, a like, so it's a threat. Yeah. Because no, not, not that you're a threat, but just, you know, in people's minds, there's, there's a negative connotation. There's, Russia is like the big scary bear that's a little, you know, everybody always talks about like, you know, like I went, last time I went home, I was shooting. Mm -hmm. And they're like, yeah, in the shooting range, mm -hmm. there's like, it's like, keep America free, learn to shoot, right? And there's another sticker. It's like the number one reason why there'll never be a Russian tank going down Park Avenue is because we all know how to shoot. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good answer. The politicians, mm. how often they use it in the political games, the Russian threat? Mm. Uh, less now. More less. Now, China's number, now China is the main threat. Any number one power needing a competitor, mm -hmm. right? And I think, I, so I put it this way. Part of it is the government using it. Part of it is society needing it. Mm -hmm. Americans always need an other to Yourself compete against. Because yeah. like I said, it's, well, I, was, I think American society is the most competitive society. And if you're like USA, USA number one, there has to be a number two, and that number two might be number one one day, and then they become a threat. When it comes to who is the bigger threat, US and Russia, I think is, oh sorry, uh, Russia or China. Look, I think there's always an outside threat that is, the American public always perceives an outside threat. It was, you know, it was Russia. Then it became the terrorists, and now it's becoming China. And there's always an other that you have to drop bombs on. There's always an other that's trying to like attack American way of life. And even they, if, if, even, even they're, if not, they're not. But I think honestly, like American society needs that because Americans are such. It's such a multifaceted, multicultural melting pot of random people together. In order for there to be a feeling of unity mm -hmm. in a lot of times there needs to be a comp an outside threat that's for every country we are the same yeah. exactly always need an outside threat yeah but if you're a leader in many many ways yeah. does it make you a threat to uh, the rest of the world because you are looking for a threat even I there is only, no threat. I only think it makes you a threat to it make you a bad guy you know it makes you a bad guy to the person you think is a threat yes so now yeah. the US is obviously an adversary to China and Russia you have a lot of Russian friends, yeah. including me, I hope. Um, and in your personal opinion, what's the biggest difference in mentality between Americans and Russians? <laughs> yeah, this question, I can arrive pretty confidently at an answer because I have really good friends uh, like you and others that I've spent a lot of time with. And as I mentioned before, I didn't really have any Russian friends before I came to China. Now I have a lot. And the biggest thing that I've noticed, I, I always use this example when actually other people have asked me that too, is I won't use names, but I was on a beach with American friends mm -hmm. and we were having fun, we were drinking. It was sunny where we were, but out on the horizon, we could see thunderstorm. Okay. And it was, you could see pouring rain, you could see the lightning flashing. And with the beach we were, there was an island out there and that island was getting rained on. Mm -hmm. Right? And we're sitting on the beach, Americans, a bunch of Americans, talking, we're like, oh my God, we're so lucky it's not raining here. 
look at those poor suckers over there, they're getting poured on, and we just carry on drinking. Five minutes later, mm -hmm. my Russian friends arrive, like looking like red and panicked and like upset. And they're like, what the fuck are you guys doing? We gotta go, we gotta go. I'm like, whoa. They're like, can't you see a storm is coming? <laughs> Russian panicking that much? The storm is coming. Like we should go. A storm is coming. Like it's about to, it's about to become a shit day. And there, th that frames the outlook. The outlook, the American outlook is it's sunny here. It's raining over there. We're, life's so good. See We're positive lucky. Positive things. The Russian outlook is there's a storm coming. You have no idea that it's coming, but you just assume that every, all hell's about to break loose because you see a storm. Okay. And That's it, actually pretty smart. It's, 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 it, it, that story captures, I think, like a lot of the difference between how Americans and Russians approach things. And it's not about being optimist or pessimist. It's just about Russians, in my opinion, find a way to be unhappy. <laughs> yeah, really looking to they, the they, way. They, they, they can find, a, not only find a reason, but find a way mm -hmm. to be unhappy. It's like anyone can find a reason, like, oh, this isn't that great. But they will find a way to make that thing that's not great, make them unhappy. Okay. Whereas Americans generally, in my opinion, again, okay. try, and try to find a way to ignore the unpleasant things and just maybe it kind of blinds them mm -hmm. to reality, mm -hmm. but focus on the, the, the candy canes and rainbows. Okay, okay. Right? Um, in Russia, we have one <laughs> saying, Obama pee in our staircases. Okay. It's actually the meaning of this. It's like when you're trying to find to blame someone else in your own problems yeah and like in general we say ah oh, yeah i'm americans again yeah yeah blame americans and everything yes who pee on your uh, staircase is definitely obama yeah and do you have in this in america something similar like a thing to blame other people no. in your own problems no no okay so like basically if you fucked up, you you're fucked thinking up. that you fucked up. Okay. One, one, one area where I think this is changing mm -hmm. is I see this happening with China more and more. That the US is blaming China for stuff that the US didn't, should have just done better themselves, mm -hmm. especially with economics. Like, you know, the US complained that America, that China is out competing or not, not competing fairly, mm -hmm. which is true. There's a lot of areas where the China isn't being fair, but there's also a lot of areas where the US just dropped the ball. And I think, you know, especially with economic arguments, there are a lot of times when blaming the U.S. is blaming China for things that actually the U.S. just should have been better at okay. foreseeing. And now that we're trying to catch up. A big question. This question is very short, but actually uh, a b very big thing. What's going to happen when, between Russia and America relationships as a country in like next decade or couple decades? Depends on Russia. The future of the Russian, China, uh, Russia, U.S. relationship depends a lot on what happens after Putin. The whispers in DC mm -hmm. is that in general, uh, the US wants to pursue a more friendly relationship with Russia so that it can focus its attention on China. Ah, uh, okay, it does make sense actually. Um, and I think the US also does not want, or wants to become like a wedge or doesn't want relationships between Russia and China to remain too warm for too long. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because the biggest threat would be a really close relationship between Russia and China. Chinese money and Russian like resources. Resources, yes. Yeah. Chinese capital, Chinese population, Chinese human and human capital, monetary capital, Russian resources aligned 100% against the US or the West would be disastrous. In the long run, I think the US is hoping to eventually kind of reach at least, and I think honestly, mm -hmm. this was the big driver between the summit between Biden and Putin. Mm -hmm. I think the whole idea behind it was for Biden to kind of lay down his red lines or whatever. Just be like, pretty sick put a box mm -hmm. and just say, don't come out of this box and we won't fuck with you, don't fuck with us, so that we, I, the US can focus on China. And I think the hope is that Russia starts to realize eventually that it's better to deal with the devil you know than the devil you don't. Okay. And uh, be closer to the West than closer to China. Because any relationship between Russia and China, uh, it's essentially gonna end with Russia being like China's little brother. Because, and that's something that I think most Russians wouldn't want, or of course. Russian society wouldn't want, but it's just the reality of the economic situation and the situation on the ground, is that any kind of military or economic partnership, Russia's gonna be the second power.
China is going to have a, I mean, right now, Russian technology, military technology is generally better than China's, but that's rapidly, they've basically copied everything already. Mm. They've already copied an aircraft carrier and made another one. So it's rapidly becoming the case that Chinese, the China's having a much more powerful military than Russia, already a much bigger economy. And any kind of relationships, Russia would be the junior partner. So it's better to be kind of the scary Russian bear partner with the West than being China's bitch, little basically. Panda. <laughs> yeah, little panda. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what should happen in Russian and American relationships in the short term? Mm. Yeah, and is it possible to turn like to s swipe every all the bullshit what's happened in the last like 10 years or something? Can anything happen like to make bring relationships to way better quality level. Oh, I think if anything, the history between Russia and the US shows that it's really possible for the relationship to change quickly. I think the history between the two countries shows that, right? Mm -hmm. Even through the Cold War, there were big ups and downs, right? And even after, and obviously after the Cold War, you know, the relationship changed completely. And okay, the last 10, 20 years, it's changed a lot again. But I think it's absolutely possible for the relationship to warm very quickly, mm -hmm. you know? How different is life in U.S. compare movies and real life? Mm. American movies, I mean. I don't know. It depends on the movie, right? But I think... Like the... I don't know. I think the vast majority of people who watch a lot of American TV shows and movies have a pretty good understanding of life in the U.S. Okay. You know, uh, you know if you watch a summer blockbuster action movie, of course, it's like... Yeah, yeah. You know, it's not... It's Quite not hard a, watching Avengers. Right, right. Understand. If you watch Avengers, it's not a real window into American life. But I think if you watch a lot of TV, especially, you know, uh, TV shows, I think TV shows give you a good window into the good and bad things in mm -hmm. the U.S., you know? I think actually, you know, U.S. pop culture is always a reflection of what's happening in the U.S. at that moment. Yeah, especially all the black watch TV shows right now on Netflix. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, three questions. What will be with U.S. after 10 years? I'll tell you what I think. I guess the most probable outcome as opposed to what I want mm -hmm. to have happen. The most probable outcome is US, 10 years from now, GDP wise is number two behind China. Mm -hmm. uh, and the US is a lot more uh, closely connected to Europe because I think there will be a complete understanding that if the US wants to compete with China one on one, it's a really dangerous game to play. Mm -hmm. And the best way to compete with China is to build a coalition mm -hmm. of Western democracies and hopefully including one day Russia. Russia. Okay. So I think economically the US will be doing fine. Um, I think US society will, will be fine. And, uh, but I definitely think that GDP wise, that number will be smaller than China's. Okay. Unless some r massive like economic catastrophe happens in China. China after 10 years. The last, we all, everyone talks about this amazing China miracle and how great the government was at growing the economy and all this stuff, I give them maximum props, okay? Like, mm -hmm. I'm the first one to say that government did a great job. Mm -hmm. I'm the first one to say that, yeah, it's amazing the absolute creation of wealth and how quickly the economy has grown. And it's, um, it's, I mean, it's one of the reasons we live here. It's awesome to be here now, right? It's like amazing time to be in China. But, but it's also, there is always a but. But it's also really easy to swim far when you're swimming with the current. It's an indisputable fact that in the, in the late 90s, early 2000s, the US and the Western world in general decided that they wanted China to grow. Mm -hmm. The US basically like, let China into the WTO and the US pursued a pro-China growth policy mm -hmm. because the idea was China grows, China becomes rich, China becomes a democracy and China joins Team USA. Mm -hmm. This was the thinking. This has turned out not to be accurate as of right now, mm -hmm. right? And now, instead of actively trying to promote China's growth, the US is actually trying to rein in China's mm -hmm. growth. And so it's a lot harder to swim against the current. And the current has changed for China over the past few years, where, they're no, where the rest of the world is not cheering for China to grow and basically just giving China capital, giving China technology, and giving China open access to their markets. That's done now. China now has to fight for access. China has to fight for its techn technological supremacy. And China ha has to fight a lot of trade barriers going up against it. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot harder to swim against the current, is what I'm trying to say. And over the next 10 years, I think that's going to create a lot of problems for the Chinese economy. 
and it's going to be a, I don't, I don't want to say it's going to like cause problems for the government, but it will be a stress on the Chinese society. Okay. Russia after 10 years. Russia, okay, let's assume Putin dies in the next 10 years, within the next 10 okay. years. Okay, both of the... Okay, if Putin is still the same, still Russia just keeps declining as a power. It's, it's still dangerous. Like losing everything. It's not losing everything. No, I wouldn't say losing everything. Russia, Russia is the number six, seven economy in the world. If Putin stays in power, I, I would never say Russia, Putin is going to drive Russia into the ground. I would not say mm -hmm. that because I think that's a very politically loaded mm -hmm. statement. And it's also like a judgment on his capacity to be president. Mm -hmm. I think that if you just look at where the trajectory of Russia has been under Putin, that trajectory mm -hmm. will stay the same. And that trajectory is a lot of spending on the military, a lot of positioning itself on the world stage as a power player, mm -hmm. while at the same time the economy just doesn't grow and just shrinks and falls behind other powers mm -hmm. in, in relative terms. So it's a lot of basic bluffing. You basically like spending a lot of money on your military, like basically figuring out how asymmetrically to get as much bang for your buck in terms of like deploying that military. But really the, go the economy has dramatic uh, deep issues mm -hmm. that aren't getting fixed and are being ignored. But so if he stays in power, he's going to keep ignoring economic if, issues. If he go away in somehow. If he goes away, it's basically 1990s part two. It's like, it's like where the U.S. screwed up in the late 20s. The U.S. screwed up in the, in the 90s. The biggest mistake the U.S. made, I don't know if it's the biggest, but one of the biggest mistakes the U.S. made in the 20th century was after the fall of the Soviet Union, not doing what we did with Germany and Japan, which is basically going in and helping to rebuild society and preventing shit from just totally falling apart. After the war, the U.S. spent billions of dollars in Japan and in Germany. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, in Europe, we had the whole Marshall Plan, right, to basically rebuild Europe. And, you know, Germany, okay, we stayed in Germany, but the whole point was, yeah, you dropped nukes on Japan, but basically, like, the next 40 years, we invested in Japan and basically brought Japan into the Western liberal economic system, right? That was the whole idea. And that didn't happen after the fall of the Soviet Union. The U.S. basically just said, we won, yeah. peace off. And Russia went to shit in the 90s, right? The economy tanked. And it was just a really desperate time for the Russian economy. And then that gave rise to basically Putin being able to do, become who he's become. And I think it, the good thing, from the American perspective, about the Russian government is that it's a one-man show. And if that one man collapses or dies, it's chaos. And from an, again, from the American government's perspective, mm -hmm. what I would assume they're thinking mm -hmm. is that that's an opportunity, right? So, you know, I always say the best thing that can happen for U.S.-Russia relations is Putin stops being Russian's president. Because but after he, after Putin, there's a big question mark. There's a huge power vacuum. The Russian government is not designed around any kind of successor. Yeah. Right? It's designed around one dude. He's like the beating heart of the watch. And if he fails, the watch stops working. You basically pursue a relationship <coughs> with Russia like you've pursued with you know, Japan or, or Germany, where you're like, all right, guys, we want to invest. Like, we want to open up everything and basically bring Russia into Team USA. Right? Okay. That's, like the, that's the hope. So I would say, if you ask me in 10 years, the, the, the best possible outcome between the US and Russia would be Putin going away, one way or the other, and the U.S. and Russia, there being a power vacuum that the U.S. is able to basically like use to pursue better relationship. Okay, okay, because that's the point. Like that's one of the biggest fears in Russia that he will go away. That's why people keep reelecting him, no matter what people talking about, like fake elections. Mm. 90% of my friends, okay, not 90, like 80% of my friends, if you will ask them, like if tomorrow is election like who you will elect mm. they will elect putin again mm -hmm. so people re-electing him again and again and again just because they raised the 90s yeah. when we were alone and there was no money nothing and there was a absolute chaos right. and people just afraid to come back to that right. chaos but the longer that goes on the worse it's going to be after after he dies yeah. he's going to go he's going to die eventually anyway, yeah. you know right and there's a there's going to be a time where russia has to ask itself what comes next Actually, question from me: mm. What do you think in American society? The, how big percentage of the people who think like you? Small. Small. Yes. The rest of the people, what do? You? 
nuke Russia. No, they don't think about attacking Russia. They just they just don't care. Oh. <laughs> <Let> them <die. laughs> They just I think most like I just, you know when you asked me about uh, you know who owns Ukraine, and I said you know who cares. It's basically just reflecting what most people in the U.S. think mm, about they Ukraine. They just don't give a shit. Because it's I mean when you have uh, you have your own problems, right? And this is always the issue with American foreign policy, is that most American people have their own problems right here in their own city, in their own neighborhoods. They don't care about what's happening in Crimea. Okay. Right? Crimea is not the top of their list of things that they're worrying about. Even if they know where it is, even if they understand that uh, it's probably not a really good idea for Russia to be annexing like part of another country. Like, it's not, it's 99 problems, but Crimea ain't one. Basically, okay. you know? Like <laughs> Last three questions. Last three questions. Yeah, yeah. First one. What's your personal American dream? My personal American dream is use the amazing uh, free trade, open borders, kind of like economic system that the U.S. has built around the world that to allow me to live in other countries uh, and still enjoy like being American and like having access to a, mm -hmm. a lot of the comforts mm -hmm. of the U.S. Um, and create something that I find valuable and that I can generates a lot of revenue okay because other, generally other people find valuable mm -hmm. if you create something that other people find valuable you're gonna get paid and buy lots of land in somewhere like montana and have just a nice large area that i can just call my own okay cool and relax cool. did you ever try of course you did but people asking like this did you ever try russian or ukrainian cuisine how what do you feel about that and do you have any favorite dishes you already know my affinity for Russian salad, mm -hmm. especially with some beluga vodka mm -hmm. on New Year's. That's always great. So Russian salad, I would say, is my favorite. Depending on the lady who's making your borscht, they've had some good borscht, right? And in general, I like Russian food a lot. Um, I, I like potatoes and meat, so it's like pretty easy to like Russian. No, food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you like potatoes and meat, but about like pickles, like sour. Yeah, it's thing. all good. Yeah, it's all good. Yeah. Okay, and the last question. Uh, we have a legendary movie in Russia called Brother. Mm. Like there is Brother One and Brother Two. And in a, it's about a guy who just came from army in the 90s and realized that Russia is fucked mm. completely and he have no, uh, no way to like live normal life. Mm. So he become kind of a gangster. In a second movie, he moved to US mm. looking for some, his brother or something like this. Uh, and there was a moment that became legendary in Russia when he talking to American guy and asking him a question. And this question became kind of like a famous saying, famous quote in Russia. And people love to ask each other. It's like the same who's Crimea, mm -hmm. yeah. But who's Crimea came just from nowhere, from the situation. This came from movie. And the question is, American guy, tell me, what is the strength? Like a power, the strength. Mm. Like wh what it comes from? Hope and fear. Hope and fear. Yeah. I am an economic student. Until last year, I studied in London. And this year, I am moving to the Netherla to Netherlands to complete my bachelor's, uh, which I didn't finish in the UK for many, many reasons. I want to continue my studies and eventually get a PhD in economics. But I'm torn between the US and Asia. On one hand, the US has Chicago, Yale, Harvard, and other top schools which I possibly get into. On the other, academia in the US getting so woke and <laughs> yeah, and that it seems impossible to do objective social science there. In Asia, there's, uh, there are good study places in Hong Kong, Singapore, and China, which look like uh, nice institutions for, to get an education form from. So my question is, is it reasonable to choose Asia and China in particular as a place to get a PhD? Will I not lose out my, no, wait, wait will I not lose out by not going to the US? Mm. Thanks a lot, friends. So if it, basically he's asking, does he, would it be better to get a PhD in econ in yeah, the US yeah, the, or China? Basically, yes. Like he I started. I would say hands down the US. US. Yeah. And I give you a couple, okay, versus China. Right? Okay. A couple of reasons. A couple of reasons are pretty clear. You know, he talked about uh, a woke mm -hmm. education system. Yeah. And okay, that's open to interpretation, right? But I think in a hard science like economics, 
Um, the numbers speak for themselves. Okay. Uh, the theories speak for themselves. Okay, on the PhD level, obviously, you're talking about a lot of higher level theory that is open to different arguments. Mm -hmm. But I would say, uh, you know, I actually got my master's in econ, mm -hmm. and I would say that uh, at this point, leading economic thought still happens in the West in general, and in the U.S. in particular, especially at some of those schools you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And I would also say that getting a PhD in China is great, um, but uh, you would have to understand that you are in communist China, mm -hmm. and the curriculum may not necessarily reflect the full spectrum of economic ideas. Okay, yeah. Because there's a sense. lot of uh, influence from the government on academic institutions mm -hmm. here. So, so basically, like if you study like physics or chemistry in China would be equal to you to the U.S. No, but economic because, because I know that for sure is not true because all of the bre best students in China are going to the U.S. just to get their PhDs. So, is there any kind of education that could be equal study like whatever in China uh, or U.S.? I don't know. I really don't know. But I do know that all of the China's brightest people are studying in the U.S. and then come back. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, I, I mean, and especially for econ, mm -hmm. you know, I think econ is one of those things that, you know, you can make the argument, does American, do a, would American schools overly emphasize kind of our Western uh, liberal economic mm -hmm. uh, mindset as mm -hmm. being like the right one? And I would say that probably on the PhD level, that would be probably one of the big things that he's debating or thinking about is in the 21st century is the post-World War II Western liberal economic outlook or way of doing things, open, open capital markets, um, the best way forward, right? Does pure capitalism allocate resources appropriately in a very quickly changing world? And there's a lot of debate about that now, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, pure capitalism in a lot of ways sometimes doesn't allocate resources, especially on a, in terms of society, doesn't always allocate resources in an equitable way, and that can yield mm, suboptimal results. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot right. there's a lot of thought in in China that you know, I think what do they call it? Capitalism with Chinese characteristics, yeah, 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 right? something like that. That that is a more optimal way of of managing your economy, right? So, I think that if you were to study that, if you were to study here in China, that would be emphasized a lot more. The Chinese view on uh, allocating resources for your country. I still have one more thing for mm. you. Look in any of these cameras, mm. and. There is a thousands of Russian people like around the world, Russian speaking people like Ukrainians, Belarusian, whatever, who will watch this video. And as an American person mm. who have a lot of Russian friends who live in China, it's not an obvious situation, you mm. know, plus you're well educated, plus you're a person of color. You have like a, a lot of things. You're a complex person. Mm. Do you have something to say to Russian people, advice or just a thing like what's come to your mind when people asking you just say to my Russian subscriber something from your heart in any kind of topic, whatever yeah. you want to say. You know, I would say this whole exercise is kind of funny because of the, the questions that come up. Uh, you know, some of the questions I think are very surface level questions, some are a little silly questions. Uh, some are asking about like fringe issues, like mm. like like transgender stuff and all this. The the number one thing I think that I would want to just share, based on my experience with my Russian friends and just traveling in general, it's actually really amazing how similar we are. You know, the point of this video is to for, to give people the chance to ask questions because they think that Americans are so different and they they're curious about it. They think that there's a big divide and that. That divide is kind of mysterious, and that, that, and then they want they have so many questions they want you to ask me, so mm -hmm. I can help them bridge this divide a little bit. And I guess my biggest takeaway is that the divide is much smaller than you mm -hmm. really think it is, much if it even exists at all. And I think in a lot of ways the divide does exist. It's because of our own mental constructs. 
And I think when we actually hang out and get to know each other, there's so much more that is brings us together and makes us very similar than yeah. we have more in apart. common than more like yeah different. and I think it's really funny when you talk to people from big countries you know powerful countries that you know have a profound history and have played you know interesting roles on the world stage you know like Russia like China like the US the people in these countries actually are shockingly similar because these countries became great powers because their people generally share similar attributes in terms of being competitive, in terms of being curious, in terms of wanting to always push the envelope, in, always, in, in terms of wanting to compete with each other. You know, we look at the space race, right? Like, we, you know, we, we fought each other to get to the moon, you know, now we're fighting China to get to Mars. It's like, we, we call each other different and we think of each other as being completely different people. We're in actually, we're on the same boat. We're just really, we're just all competitive and we all want to, we all want to be number one in some way. And we all think of ourselves as exceptional. Mm -hmm. And we all think of the other as exceptional in good ways and bad ways as well. So I think the more you, the more you interact with, with my Russian friends, with my Chinese friends, the more you realize that actually, in a lot of ways, you admire each other. There's more that makes Russians and Americans similar than makes like Americans and like, uh, you know, Spanish people or something, you know? or people are like from Thailand or something. It's like these, these countries that have such great pride, that have such great power, that have such great history, they have these things because their populations share certain attributes. And I think you start to recognize that in each other the more time you spend together. Thank you so much for being my guest on my channel today. Thank my you pleasure. so much. My yeah. pleasure. I will die making subtitles yeah. for this video. <laughs> no, I was, I was I trying was to like, speak slowly. Yeah, last, <laughs> you know, last few <laughs> minutes I was thinking like we filmed almost two hours. Anyway, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We talk about a, a lot of interesting things and sun is going down. Yeah. You have some plans for today. I have some plans for today, mostly editing this video <laughs> and dying near a computer. All so right. thank you one more time. No, my pleasure. Let's go. My pleasure. Good, good, good. This is fun.